Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Morelia Python Radio. With me tonight is not Eric, but I have Keith McPeak, Rob Stone, and, of course, our guest, uh, Mr. Craig Chumbrower. We're going to um, talk with him about basically just snake stuff, herping, everything else we've seen on this, uh, or, or his kind of insights into our our beloved hobby and what we're at with this. Um, Eric might be in and out. I'm not sure what he's doing, but Keith, how are you? I'm doing very well. I was very excited that we had Craig coming on. Um, so I was really looking forward to this show because he always has great insight on uh, definitely the history of the herbic culture. So definitely looking forward to this one, but everything's good here. Cool. Uh, Went striper fishing the other day. I don't know if you saw my little post on Facebook, I but we did, did really well. Yeah, yeah so. I did see that. You guys went nuts. That was good. Yeah, so things are good. I feel like uh, we're winter's behind us and we're moving along now. Yep, yep. That Hopefully, because I'm about done with it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, Rob, how are you doing? I'm great, guys. I'm super excited for the show. Super excited to talk to Craig again. This will be great. Uh, yeah, so just bringing the bringing the passion because eric's uh under the weather yeah 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 he of course he does this thing where he's like we're gonna have this great show and this big guest oh i'm feeling ill and then he like <laughs> bails on me so uh that that of course will be reflected later and he and i will talk about that but <laughs> um the last one is i guess uh what we'll see is uh for me um i just pulled a bunch of eggs off of my from underneath my olive pythons, so this is the fourth year running uh, with olive python babies. So um, it's kind of like we're hitting the ground and I'm not trying to keep track of how many clutches I got going on right now because I think I would just kind of be daunting at this point. But uh, we got to be getting up close to 80 something eggs. So, yeah. Get those bins cleaned. Bins cleaned <laughs> and incubator fired up and we'll see how it goes. But uh, anyway, let's. You know, quick uh, knock around here, but we'll go ahead and uh, bring bring Craig on. I think. Screaming. Anyway, oh, oh, oh yeah, there he back. is. He's All back. Right. I yeah, I, I'm not touching anything, and I just don't don't. Care. Yeah, <laughs> what do you think? I, I don't do anything. But Craig Trumbar, welcome to the show. Um, how are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Thank mm-hmm. you for having me on. Excellent. So, I'm not sure why, but thank you. Keith may, Keith told us you might be a guy we won't want to talk to, you know, so it well, kind of... Well, listen, this, this show, Herp History, means a lot to me that you guys started, and, and I try to think of the people that have inspired me and have been iconic in the hobby and all, and when I think of Craig, the first thing I think of is what everybody should be in this hobby. He sets an example. He's top shelf. And he's just an icon to me and somebody I look up to. I started doing shows probably in the late 80s, early 90s. I was intimidated to go up and talk to this man back in the day. And uh, to call him a friend now is is just awesome to me. And like I say, he sets the example. He sets the bar very high. And anybody who wants to be in this hobby should really, really aspire to, to be like Craig. So I'm glad to call him friend. Yeah. Well, thanks. Very generous words. Keith. So, Craig, why don't you just kind of take us back a little bit to the beginning of, you know, how you got started with reptiles? Well, briefly, uh, and, mm. and I'm a talker, so hopefully, hopefully, hopefully you're a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> that or we'll break it into two episodes. Part one, part two. Fine, go well, ahead. Well, OK. <laughs> I, you know, I, as far as I, I mean, back, I suppose around 1958, mm. a long time ago, I'm 74. So, um uh, we were stationed at Little Rock Air Force Base. My dad was a pretty famous pilot, uh, flew P-51s World War II, and he was a pilot there. So we were living on the base. I was down at the creek, and my BB gun shot a ribbon snake. Very proud of being able to shoot that snake. And I was bragging about it uh, to my fifth grade classmates, and my teacher overheard me. And I was initially educated as a teacher, and this is where teachers – which we all should aspire to be in some way, mm. uh, you know, have their story. And she challenged me. She said, well, why did you kill that snake? And I said, well, because it's a snake. And she goes, you need to go to the library and do a book report on snakes. <laughs> and so it kind of started. Next time I went down there, I caught that ribbon snake the next time. 
and I brought it back. My dad didn't like snakes, and I can remember early in Orlando when he was stationed there that there was a big eastern diamond back in the neighborhood on a canal bank, and of course, dad was a pretty good shot, and they called him, and he took his military forty-five and shot this thing, big, big snake, I mean, mm. you know, like six feet, and and, but, but I remember the construct of color and pattern in the sunlight splattered with a little red mm-hmm. blood and the rattle. And it totally mesmerized me. You know, it mm-hmm. never left me, even though, you know, later on I killed that ribbon snake. And so anyway, it kind of started like that. And then, you know, from there, um, you know, uh, Went through a, a really rough time as a kid. My dad was killed in a boating accident. I was with him, and um, I wrote about that in my book because I felt mm-hmm. like everybody can relate to losing somebody. And I lost him at 10, and it was very difficult. So, um, but being a, and I was kind of shipped off to uh, my grandfather's farm for the summer, which, okay. well, my mom got things in order, which, which really um, was, was probably a great thing. And uh, I just collected every snake I could on that farm. And I kept my grandmother was very good about it okay. and uh, really got into it. And she said, well, you need to read about snakes. You can't just catch them. And I mean, so I had really I had good encouragement to do the right things. And I just couldn't get enough of it. And and then, of course, when I went home at the end of the summer, being, you know, 10 years old, I was pretty good at milking old mom because, you know, her poor son lost his dad, so I'm going to take advantage of that and have a snake collection. And pretty soon, yep. I pretty soon I was collecting old TV sets. You pull the picture tubes out. You had a glass front. You had four legs. Put some beaver board on the back, and you had a cage. And I had them stacked all over the room. <laughs> that's that's and, awesome. And, and back that's for anybody had any of that. And um, I just I started off thinking that was probably pretty normal behavior, you know. So. Um, and from there, I went to Boy Scouts, and I was 13. Mm-hmm. You had to be 16 to be a counselor, and I w- won a Reptile Merit Badge, and I knew more than the guy, the Boy Scout teaching it. <laughs> the so, guy they brought they, in they, to teach it? Yeah. Well, they, said, well, they gave me free free camp. I was a poor kid, kid, and they said, hey, you want to come back and teach us? You get free camp all summer. So, right. you know, so, I mean, one thing led to another, and. Um, from there, I mean, um, I started encouraging my mom to take me out and drop me off, look for snakes. And we eventually made it down to Curtis at Wild Cargo in South Florida. And, Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to, you know, go for snake and, um, and, uh, I think it was $7 and mom said, that's a lot of money. And so I promised to, you know, wash the car for 45 years and, (laughs) (laughs) You know, you know, and then sell um, sell yourself you know, down the river. Everything you could do, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and I think I don't think my story is unique. I think we all get a start in some way. Mm-hmm. But I think I think there's a commonality here, a kinship, because I I I think it's it starts with a visual thing. Mm-hmm. If you slow the process down and get close enough, you know, people that kill snakes bend in, take a good look. But when you start looking at like I said, that construct of pattern and color, and 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 it 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 either creeps you out or you're a fan for life, and it starts early. And yeah. I don't think it leaves you. So um, I think, like many others, my story's not you. That's kind of the very beginning, you know. So then, 1960, um, my dad was killed in '59, and we moved to South Florida. And, of course, uh, we heard of the Miami Serpentarium, and Mom was a good-looking blonde. She was 38, and um, we went down to the Serpentarium and met Bill Host, and um, he became a mentor, and like a father, I bugged the hell out of him. I was down there. Every time she would go to the commissary, she would drop me off at the Serpentarium. (laughs) I'm I'm tagging along Bill Host, you know. And Bill Host was really good to me because, and and I I can say this, I mean, uh, you know, he, 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 Bill Haas liked women. He he was a pretty good flirt, and he liked my mom. I knew that. <laughs> he was flirting with my mom in that gift shop, and he was giving me gifts, and I didn't have to pay. Mom was impressed, and I'm thinking down the line, I go, God, I'm going to have a new daddy, and it's going to be Bill Haas. <laughs> you know, so um, so I had a great I had a great mom who was willing to 
encouraged that. And, you know, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was a tough go without that dad. And, and mm-hmm. we didn't get any benefits really from the military. It was a five year delay for some reason. And we, we were poor. Um, I never felt like that, but, uh, Bill Haas took me under his wing, and then old Frank Weed Sr. down in Fort Lauderdale off Flamingo Road. We went out there, and he'd have two big screen box cages, one with water snakes and water snakes, and another one with corn snakes. And he had a little aquarium with scarlet king snakes. Mm-hmm. And, man, I wanted one of those, you know, but they were five bucks. And, and so he took me under his arm and said, well, come on, grab a flashlight. We're going to go catch one. And. On um, both sides of Flamingo Road were um, Australian pines that were planted back in the 20s. And he would walk along those at nighttime and, and, and collect them. And sure enough, we found one. So, it, so, you know, for the generosity of men willing to take time, uh, and that's why I tell guys at shows, man, hey, concentrate on these kids. Give mm-hmm. them a snake. Encourage them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and just to that note, so I gave, years ago, I gave a kid a corn snake. because mom really couldn't afford it. I gave him an oak tea corn. And so a few years ago, we're at the show, and I just, I just had a little table now. It's no big deal. And I'm sitting there, and I looked at Linda, and I said, man, look at this guy coming in. He's got to be like 6'9", you mm-hmm. know, and you, you would notice that. And he keeps walking and walking. I said, wow, he's coming right over here. And he walks right up to my table. And he says, you don't remember me? He said, but... Um, I want to tell you something. He said, uh, I was in Orlando for the weekend, saw the show. You gave me a corn snake years ago. I just got my Ph.D. in herpetology. Jesus. And he said, uh, you started that. So you never know. And he, he said, I got to go. Just want to say hi and left. And so, you, you know, you, ne- you never know. No. And we, we need more of that. Yeah. Um, you know, I coined this term, uh, this term, the planet snake tune, which mm-hmm. includes herpetology and herpetoculture and all of us. You know, I think it's, it's pretty fitting, but, but, um, the, the planet needs more of that. And if we're going to overcome the obstacles that are happening, like in Florida with fish and game lately and these monstrous things, uh, the only way to do that really is to educate with all the right reasons the next you know generations coming up and not just make it about uh, drawers and snakes and money yeah yeah you're you're 100 percent on that one because there needs to be we the baton was passed to us and now we have to pass it along otherwise it's just gonna drop and that's not good so well you're right and i always say uh, to everybody, I wear it out. Keith mm-hmm. can tell you that. But anytime I see something on family, you know, Facebook, I always say family more important than the planet snake tune. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and it, yeah. and it is. And, and that can be included in that family. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we need a little more of that. So, yeah, I agree. So you mentioned Bill Haas. Is there really any uh, anybody else you really looked up to? Because um, you did you said uh, right here in the notes, you got to meet Carl uh, Caulfield. Uh, I did. I did. Uh, um, in 72, um, my brother was in New York. He was an artist. Um, that's a whole story in itself, more <laughs> interesting than me. And um, uh, it was in there as an artist. And um, so I went to see him and I said, well, you know what? I'm going to stop in Staten Island Zoo and see if I can uh, meet Carl Owen. Um, and I stopped in, and he was there. He mm-hmm. had an oxygen tank and had a cannula, and so he had oxygen on. He was kind of winding down. Mm-hmm. But invited me in his office in the same Hershey's box that you see that picture in his iconic books. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I said, oh, is that the same Hershey box with a black tail? And he goes, yeah, the same aquarium, same. He goes, I don't like to change stuff. I'm sentimental. <laughs> you know. And, and was very nice. Robert Zappalorty was the keeper and the, the new guy coming mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, Bob's a little older than me. And we we had a brief relationship where we traded snakes. I got a couple of pine snakes and he got Everglades rat snakes, you know, for the zoo. But uh, I, yeah. I, I met him. He was a very generous, great man. And he gave me some notes. And uh, later on, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my chapter about subocularis and the first suboc that I found using Carl's notes to me. Mm, so, okay. Yeah. That worked out well. Um, anybody else that you really looked up to when you were kind of getting started? 
Wow, you know, um, there just were there there were so few. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Bern Bechtel, Doctor Bechtel, um, uh, w- w- was such a wonderful gentleman. He lived in Bell Dawson at the mm-hmm. time. I was in Tallahassee then as well, and um, getting started. And he took me under his wing, and he started uh, the father of genetics, he, the Gregor Mendel of that time. You know, with his corn snakes, he and mm-hmm. Palmer at the North Carolina State Museum and. And so every time they were going to flip back, of course, snail mail back then, you know, flip snakes back and forth in their albinos and their hats, you know, they'd call me and they'd go, hey, you have time to run up North Carolina, you know? And of course, I'd go up and collect. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. So, so I was I was I was their guy, you mm. know, their Uber is guys. <laughs> but really got to know him and his wife. And uh, and I actually met him hunting in Okatee. Uh, this, I was out there and then I was uh, flipping logs and it was early, I guess, well, 70s, I, I, I forget. But I, I saw this guy coming across the pine forest in, in a white shirt. I said, oh, it's a landowner. Damn. You know, <laughs> usually, I, usually I had permission and, and I did back then. And they were very good before the stampede. But I had crossed a fence. So I figured, I go, shit, here comes a landowner. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, and... Um, and he comes walking up to me, a wiry little guy, and his, you know, blood from blackberry bramble, and you know, looked at me, and he said, "Did you get one? Did you catch one?" <laughs> I didn't know what to say, and I, I, I went, uh, "No." He goes, no? What's, that, "What's in the bag?" And I went, uh, "Corn snake." <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and anyways, Burn Bechtel. He puts uh-huh. me down, and he goes, "Doctor Bechtel here." He said, "I've, I've just not had much luck, but it's, you know, it's a great day, isn't it? And just full of energy and." And so we got to know each other, and he certainly is up there. He had a lot of influence. He was a great gentleman, very kind. And his best bud was Sherman Minton, who was the grouchiest old guy you would ever meet, but a, bru- <laughs> but a, but a brilliant man. They would yeah. always stop by the table, and Burn would go, hey, what do you got? Oh, look at this morph, and just made you feel so important. And Sherman would be with him, and Sherman was a little stuffy, and he had a sport coat on, a little tie, and he's looking around. He's going, what am I doing in this building with these people with tattoos and nose rings. He was very conservative. <laughs> very conservative. And I had long hair by that mm-hmm. time. And, you know, and he looked at me like my dad would look to me like, give me two minutes. I'll cut that shit off <laughs> so quick. You know? So, you know, but in the, me- in the meantime, Burn is, you know, sitting there. Burn's going, guys, this is great, Craig. This is so good. Man, we got to write this. And what are you going to call this more? He goes, let me think about this. And let me send you some tyrosinine information and, you know, stuff way over my head at the time. And mm. so, yeah, he, he's right up there. And th- there's so many, really. Uh, there weren't that many, you know, people. And there were parallel people my age, uh, certainly Ernie Wagner on the West Coast and uh, uh, Lloyd and Sonny Lemke. Mm-hmm. They were there. And, you know, and um, uh, uh, Barney Tomberlin and Jim Brockett from Western Zoological. And... Um, Juan Cobble at East Bay Vivarium. I always tell a story. I don't know if he appreciates it, but I stopped in there once, and they they just got some Negritas in, and we went over there to see him because we wanted to buy them. We knew there were like five of them, and he pulls them out of the bag, and he's, uh, um, and I may have said this in my, in my last interview, but hmm. so he pulls the probes out, and he probes, and then he sticks it in his mouth and lubricates it, and goes the next one, sticks it in, and sticks his mouth, lubricates it, and sticks it. <laughs> And I'm with Jim Nyan, a, a, a famous guy back then. He, bless his soul, he died in prison, but uh, quite a character. You know, Jim's elbowing me and 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 saying, "Are you watching this? Are you watching this?" I go, I go, man, I ain't kissing a guy. I'm yeah. Kidding. So, so uh, I'm a storyteller, and if there's a story to tell about you and you're old, I'm 74. I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to tell on you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point. That's the whole point of this podcast is that we don't want to lose these stories. So we want well, to make sure that we have them for, for anybody who's interested. But Well, I kind of wrote my books on that. Yeah. Uh, on that key. You know, I, I didn't start. To, I think some of your pre-questions and things. Mm. I never took notes with the idea of writing books. You know, I just okay. wasn't a plan. And at some point in time, I said, you know, I want to write some of these stories about family and snakes and things. For my family and mm-hmm. my kids and grandkids, 
And I just started writing, and uh, Bob Ashley called me, and uh, he said, hey, uh, I understand you you got a little guest house there in Marathon in Texas. And I said, yeah, come on. And he was with Tell Hicks, and they mm-hmm. came in, and we had a great time. And, and um, um, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm writing a little something for the family. He goes, oh, well, let me read that. And, you know, he read a couple of chapters. said, hey, I want to publish that. And I was dumbfounded. Yeah. You know, I, I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> And it's just, it's just, and, and, you know, it, it's the reason I wrote that is, is to really, everybody has equally important and unique and cool stories to tell, especially if you're a herp guy. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I kind of did it to encourage others to, to, to write their stuff down, even if it's for their family, mm-hmm. because you've got to admit you you go to Australia, you go to this place that you have stories to tell. And some of them are funny and some of them are scary, but they're worth sharing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're 100% on that one. Yeah. So no no intentions of writing the books, but did you take notes from, like, the field, from herping? What was a good spot? What was a good find? What well, I did not, not written down. I, okay. You know, it comes from my memory. And, of course, mm-hmm. uh, there lies, you know... I've been accused of having a, a very generous creative mind. Mm. Um, I'm pretty accurate in lengths and weights because I'm old school. It's not an eight foot rattlesnake. It's five and a half. But um, <laughs> I, I think I did it fairly honest in, as, as I remember. And um, uh, but no, there was never in, any intention to kind of record it. You know, I mean, I recorded notes when I was in the crotalids and everything mm-hmm. in search of all the rattlesnakes to to match Carl's thing and as in the Arctic snakes, all the North American snakes. Um, I, I did take notes and stuff and, uh, I, I have piles of that stuff that I can, when I die, kids are going to come in and, you know, they're, they're going to say, what is all this stuff? <laughs> and I got a big black garbage bag, you know, a lot of stuff's going in there. Yeah. Telling, Keith, Keith better come and visit right now. Yeah. I and he better just come get him. Like, get I got a lot of good stuff to give to you guys. Yeah. I got, I got stuff that, that I think is incredibly neat and valuable. I, I have signed stuff. I, I have tons of stuff. I'm like Dave Barker, uh, who, unbeknownst to most, probably has the most complete herpetological library where he's got the coolest stuff. And I have lots and tons of stuff that doesn't mean anything to anybody. And at this point, if you come to see me, I have masking tape and I say, well, if you want it, put your name on it. Put your name on it. (laughs) So, you know, when I die, you come in and you go, hey, Keith wants it, man. (laughs) (laughs) Everything says Keith on it. Just put it in the bin. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I have donated a lot of stuff to you, Sark. We've raised some pretty good money. I had some clobber signed rattlesnake books and, 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 and it's time. It's time. And, and I would like to see it go to, you know, to good use and stuff. And uh, I would encourage everybody to, that's a whole different subject. Uh, uh, we've fallen short in protecting ourselves, and it's our fault because we're a cheap industry. Nobody wants to spend a thousand dollars a year, you know, to give because we're in a free hobby. Mm-hmm. And even bass fishermen, you know, pay something and do something. So, if if we're going to do that down the line, uh, things are falling very quickly, and it's going to take, you know, more than a couple guys. We we really, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, we we need to step it up and. Um, and do some major things. So I would encourage everyone to give. Yeah, definitely. It's something, especially with all the stuff that's going on down in Florida this past couple of weeks. So yeah, 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 certainly. And there's, there's, there's so many levels to that story mm-hmm. to talk about, um, you know, kind of on, on both sides, but it's, uh, it's, um, uh, the idea that that could even happen. The, the, the PR alone for any, business state agency or anything else is is in, insanely ridiculous yeah. if it, you know if it were if it were cats and we euthanize cats a woman has 90 cats you go pick them up what are you going to do and they mm-hmm. euthanize them. but the idea of a nail gun and plywood nobody would put up with that but here again the subject is and this is the, this is the problem mm-hmm. with law it's the subject of the snake yeah and, you know, you have a congressman that says, hey, Bill, I got Bill 4710. Will you help me on that? And says, yeah, well, what do you got? Oh, 63. You know, you can't. 
we don't want anybody to have any snakes uh, next door. He goes, snakes? Mm-hmm. We have snakes. Well, people have 100 snakes. And he goes, oh, sure, I'll sign that. Well, yeah. you know, without really ever understanding uh, much about that. And it really has a lot to do with the subject matter. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So com- comparing the reptile hobby that you kind of entered and, and did a lot of your work in to now – What's the real big difference? What was it like kind of back then getting into it? Well, you know, it, it wasn't about breeding. Nobody was breeding mm. snakes. People didn't know how to breed snakes. I mean, when you had people that hatched eggs caught caught something that was gravid, something that was laid eggs or had, that's just the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Fisher, the curator reptile uh, at the time at the L.A. Zoo, had a big Burmese python, and... Um, they um, they would get eggs, they'd get breeding, but they could never hatch them. They did, they just it was rudimentary. And mm-hmm. finally, this big female laid in a huge, you know, it was an end capped LA zoo and had a big water pond, you know, and it laid eggs in the pond. And you know, Harvey Fisher got there and he, you know, he said, "Oh, well, damn man," you know, and but he set them up anyway, and then they all mm-hmm. hatched. Well, the the story there is that. They needed a lot more moisture. They were right. these pythons. And, you know, you never thought to say, hey, these things come from Burma. It's soaking wet over there. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it, re- it really sounds simple now, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't. And we, we, you didn't even have pairs. We just had snake collections. And there okay. were very few places to buy a snake. You could go to Field and Stream, and in the back there would be an advertisement, you know, for a rat snake or a water snake or a surprise, you get a surprise snake. You didn't even know what you were getting. Surprise. And, and you know, um, it was crazy. And, and yeah. there were a few, few uh, Bill Chase down in Miami. I used to go down there. He had elephants. You'd walk in, there's there's elephants and leopards and tigers and a snake room. And it was crazy, you know. Jesus. And And we would trade. So if we collected something and we wanted something exotic or foreign, we would trade for that. And then, uh, then they came up with a venomous permitting system. Uh, I, I think I finally gave mine up, but I think I was maybe the oldest venomous reptile permit holder in Florida. Maybe a few others before me, but it was five dollars, and you just got the permit. There, were, there were no restrictions or requirements. You just had to have the five. They needed the or training. They just no, needed no, their five dollars. No inspections. <laughs> no inspections or anything, you know? Which, which, you know, there, there, it's a two-way sword here. Yeah, there, there does need to be some controls, and and of course, we know in the industry today they're irresponsible people. And okay, but, but I remind fish and game and people when I speak and stuff, I say, hey, look, uh, you know, I've chosen not to hunt anymore, but I, I don't have anything against hunters that hunt correctly and properly, and it's okay. And and but there are some really bad, crazy hunters. And it, yeah. it's no different, really, than our industry. So same thing with fishermen. Mm-hmm. They're saying, you know, it's, it's really with anything. Mm-hmm. And you know, the majority of us are, uh, we, we may look a little strange at times, and, but we're really good people. And, and uh, you know, because of a few, and here again, because of subject matter, it's a snake, mm-hmm. you know, that gets the attention. You know, it's, it's always the guy, and I have nothing against tattoos now. Like I said, I was the first guy you ever saw with long hair that was wasting. But, you know, very different looking, and of course that's the story that makes the, the news, mm-hmm. and it's always that guy with some terrible story about a snake, and, you know, here we are. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, um, we, 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 we still can improve on that and do our job and do that, and it's responsibility of everybody out there to do that. You don't just get your collection without some responsibility for what yeah. you're doing. And that's yeah. just a fact. And, you know, if you want to lose this all together, then just ignore all that and, and not do something. So um, we don't want to do that. And so mm-hmm. we need to work a little bit harder, I think. Yeah. So when everything started shifting into, like, the breeding did yep. you immediately jump on, grab yourself a pair, and chuck them together and have fantastic success immediately, or was it did it take a little bit? Oh no, no, no! It's, it's rather <laughs> humorous, you know. It's cra- no crazy stuff, and uh, really mm. funny at this time, but really confusing. And and um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I remember 
I was in Venom stuff, and, and I had a pair of uh, uh, ser- uh, Serastis, I think Gasparetta, um, and, um, and um, you know, they're supposed to be um, live bearers, mm-hmm. and from all the information I had, and, uh, and they locked up, and they bred, and um, uh, she laid eggs. And, and I went, I went, what? what Wait what? a minute. <laughs> These are the vipers, not the, the, the vipers. And then check this out. They hatched mm. in five days. So, you know, they retain the oh. egg till the right amount of moisture. You know, it, it's all because of the desert. But, you know, there's nothing uh. stuff written down back then. Um, there, everything was so new, but it was really, really fun because everything was so new. That's uh, cool. I, I got a, a bunch of baby rhino vipers. And you know, you know how gorgeous animals are, and yeah, you know, you know, had them in there, and they started dying, and they were healthy, and couldn't figure it out. And we learned they had a big water bowl; they just don't go to the water bowl and drink. They land the forest floor, and get, took an atomizer, and started spraying them, and they drink off their backs, and they they survive. You know, the next thing. very simple things, right? As at the advent of herpetoculture, and of course. There was no technology. There was snail mail and a phone, and there weren't that many people. Mm-hmm. There were no real experts. The, the experts were zoo people who were also challenged as well. <laughs> so, yeah, once we decided that we could breed things and we started figuring it out, um, then it launched a missile. Yeah. We wanted to breed stuff, you know. Uh, because nothing cooler than walking in and and seeing that egg sled. And to this day, it's seventy four. I go in there, and yeah. whether it's a corn snake or not, I just go, man, it's so cool. So yeah, uh, yeah. You so a- it, it kind of launched it. The thing is, we didn't have. There were no. There was no zoo herp or zoo med or any of that stuff. We made our own cages and we made our hide boxes and we made all kinds of stuff and everything was homemade and. Yeah, that's really how I got into woodworking and stuff. So um, much different today and and, yeah. and much easier for that. But in some ways, we've lost something in that you had to think and figure it out. How, should, mm-hmm. how big should a hide box be? And, 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 you know, we incubated snake eggs in newspaper that we would wet and make a mulch out of <laughs> with our hands. Okay. And throw it in a container. And Geb, my best friend, um, uh, it was really funny. He'd pull a handkerchief out of the drawer and run it under the faucet and throw it in. Oh, it still does the same thing, by the way, and throw it in there. And he goes, you're making it too complicated. <laughs> There's something to say for that. Uh, yeah, now, yeah. Look, look, I've evolved. I listen to what you guys say. <laughs> and I went from newspaper to sphagnum moss to, you know, now I do the, the pearl and all the other stuff mm-hmm. and, and, and learned that. But in reality... Um, Heat and moisture and the right stuff is what you need in the right quantities. <laughs> and, you know, it's good enough. I tell people, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> your house, your collection, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many different ways to skin the cat. Just well, as long really as he got, yeah, just as long as he's yeah. got the right ingredients, the eggs will hatch. Yeah. Well, just because somebody <laughs> Reptile Magazine says, hey, this is the way to do it. Yeah. And you say, yeah. well, let's see, I got an 87% hashing rate. <laughs> Gosh, I think I need 95%. Well, you're probably not going to get it. Yeah. You're going to use the new thing and get 87% where you are if you have the basic principles in that. So. Yeah. yeah. Keith also does a lot of woodworking for his cages. Can you talk about that a little bit and kind of the, the appeal yeah, of the craftsmanship I, aspect of that? Yeah, I'm a ta- I am build tables and carved wood and inlay. Uh, snakes, rattlesnakes, and stuff, and make these boxes and um, um, and and do stuff. Um, it's it's a passion of mine, and I know Keith's, Keith's pretty good too. But it's always going hand in hand. So all of my cages are um, uh, they're all wood, glass fronted, uh, all hand built, even the light hoods, which are above, like the sun. And I, and I do have one set of drawers and things, but but I. Look, I want to go into a room and I want to see the snake. Right. It teaches yes. me not only about that particular specimen, what that male or female is doing, it teaches me about species. Mm-hmm. And I look, I'm I'm not the smartest guy in the block, and I I can't say what I've contributed or anything. But I, I will say 
um, you know, other than Tommy Crutchfield, I, I, you know, I've probably had as many or more species of snakes, venomous, not venomous, than, than anybody who's out there today. I've, I've gone through the lapids and, you know, from stupid stuff. <laughs> skip, skip the mambas <laughs> real quickly. Mm. You know, Jameson's mamas and black mamas. I mean, maybe a, a western or something. Okay, but certain snakes need to stay out there. Forest cobras, another one. <laughs> you know, king cobras are extremely smart. You better mm-hmm. be a smart guy, and I'm not. So, but <laughs> but you know, I have had a lot of species and learn. And so, what I wanted to learn, I wanted to look through front cages. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to enjoy that. I'm going to walk in with a cup of coffee and look at stuff, you know. And I'm not slamming guys. It's, it's a very convenient, effective way to do it. And I, and I have a set of drawers that I made, you know. <laughs> and, um, but, um, and, and I think the advent of that was, was kind of Bob Applegate. You know, he had mm-hmm. the little hidden drawer and everything. And I knew Bob and, um, uh, back then and, and started some of that. But uh, I wanted to see stuff and... I'll give you an example. I, I remember, you know, I, I had um, can teals, uh, um, Taylor Eye, but by the way, Taylor Eye, the first ones that came in. Louie called me up and said, hey, man, we got these. And so, you know, I had a pair. And we, of course, the babies had yellow tails and caught them. And you awesome. go, you know, it's just really cool, man. It's caught them. But it was never written or seen or observed that adults do that as well. Because you lose some of that lime green coloration, like the worm and stuff. And if I didn't have front glass cages, I walk in the room and I went, wow, man, look at that, man. The adults were coddling and they were coddling. And, you know, it was a food thing. It, it wasn't, you know, a, a breeding thing. It was a food thing. So little things like that that you yeah. get to observe. And I'm not slamming anybody else the way they do things. It's just for me, my preference is I want to see stuff and enjoy it. Yeah. And it, it teaches you a lot. Yeah, it does. One, one of the things and the species, yeah. One of the things that I do like about the old school guys too, it, when they build their own cages, is their collections are unique. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like when you go and you see homemade cages and the way they designed that cage with the lighting, the doors, every little aspect, ventilation, the size for the species, and everything. It's it's that person's vision you know, for that animal. And I, I find that really interesting to go into somebody who's built their own stuff and, and just checking that part out, let alone the animals themselves, just why they did what they did versus a cookie kept cutter type mm-hmm. setup. You know? Well, Keith, 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 spot on. You're spot on, Keith. That's exactly right. Yeah. And my last set of cages I built 35 years ago, they looked like they were built yesterday. I take care of them. And like I said, the light hoods that I made are on top and, and I borrowed something from Bern Bechtel. So Bern Bechtel lived in Valdosta. He had a big home, a beautiful home. He was a physician, dermatologist. And he and Betty were in there. And you'd walk in this beautiful antique furniture living room. And then right in the living room were all these snake cages. <laughs> and and Bern would build his own. But listen, Bern would take some plywood, put it together with nails, nails and plywood. You know how that works. And then um, he had a bucket of white it looked like whitewash but you know it was paint and it was open with a brushing and when the snake would defecate he'd scoop the chips out take the white paint and slap it in the bottom to clean it <laughs> with if he took the snake out and put it out the cage and so there was stuff drying and stuff but in each cage he had a, a elevated hide box and he mm. used tongue depressors from his practice and made a little groove and slid that box in with a hole all of my cages have that mm-hmm so for arboreal stuff, they use it, mm-hmm. but you'd be surprised in captivity, of course, captive conditions. A lot of things feel more secure. They get up there and they go and elevate and stay up there. So uh, lots of little things in those cages, double screen that I use, not screen, but I used um, uh, eighth inch hardware, which I sprayed with a hard enamel. So I made it slippery, which hmm. I couldn't rub their nose. And I used double screening so that you couldn't accidentally get nailed through, you know. Right. But, but things that evolved went along the way and did that. And um, I'm, I've loved the way I've done it. And like I hear again, I'm not criticizing anybody else. But I wrote a chapter exactly on how to build those cages. And 
you know, measurements and everything. Uh, coffee in the wood shop. Um, it, it really is probably whiskey in the wood shop. But uh, <laughs> Bob Ashley, I'm the only book. All of his books, his eco books, have made it into the national park system. And I'm mm. the only book that's not in there because, uh, you know, uh, uh, an occasional F bomb. And I'm just <laughs> world famous for. <laughs> I don't mean to, uh, you know, I mean, all my little grandkids cuss because of me and uh, kids, my kids hate me. So, but, you know, I'm just saying. That's Punctuates a point. the story. Yeah, thank you. It, it enhances it. <laughs> but that that's awesome. I know we, we like I know that the, the two other guys on here can definitely relate with like stories and friendships and, and going out and, and herping and stuff like that. I know you said it was partly because you wanted the stories to make sure they lived on for your, your family and your kids and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But is it also just to make sure that some of the like some of that stuff that you adventures you went on with some of these guys herping around kind of just stuck out there and remained? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's as much about the people surrounding what mm -hmm. we do. Without those other people, you're not sharing anything. So, mm -hmm. so it's as much about those people and those characters and those times and those trips. And there's nothing really unique about my books in that everybody has their own stories. And it was really to encourage other people to, to take the time and write it down if for no other reason for themselves and, and tell those stories. Because, uh, you know, every collecting trip has some commonality in it. Mm -hmm. And we all know that. Uh, tricks being played, craziness, you know, yep. uh, some of us should have died <laughs> in certain situations. <laughs> some of us woke up in the morning and wished we had died. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories and, and it's part of it. And, and I think it's relatable and, you know, people like to read that stuff, but um, I, I have some wonderful people I've worked with and, uh, my my old pal, we did so much herping together, and he really introduced me to West Texas when I think Blair Blair's King Snakes were described in '57, I believe, uh, something. But you know, we kind of knew what those were, and, and we were some of the first to go out there. We didn't know what we were looking for. We drive through the cuts, and we, we there. You know, Denny Miller hadn't written his paper. There wasn't anything to read about anything, and the Davis Mountain King Snake. Uh, was a different species. It wasn't related to to Blair's, and you know, Alterna was separate. So, anyway, um, but uh, it's as much, if not more, about the people, mm -hmm. you know, in those things. And I included my family almost every year in these adventures. You know, they wanted to go to Disney World, but I said, you know, the hell with that. We're going to go snake hunting. <laughs> oh, yeah, not not again. <laughs> they look back now and they say, you know, it's the best time of your life. We, we right. had great times, and you'd see stuff cross the road that weren't snakes, and it, we shared all that. And of course, they were asleep by 10, and then you could really get into collecting, you know. So, <laughs> But I would encourage people to, to include their families, and especially their children, mm -hmm. uh, just for the adventure itself. So, Is there, um... That's great, Greg. Um, you're, so your books both kind of remind me, at least in – in the spirit, never mind the idiosyncrasies, right? Uh, coming from love of Carl Cosfeld's, um, snakes and snake hunting. And right. I was curious out of that, if, um, you had books that were formative for you. I know that, that book in particular was formative for me, even to the point where now I, uh, I'm buying it for people that I go on trips with to, uh, kind of hopefully inspire them because I think, yes, yeah, especially in this online age, a lot of, a lot of the difficulty and the challenge and the fun of the challenge is lost. And I think your books are an awesome, you know, kind of bringing to life the same concept that was present in that book. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, some people have, you know, some people have compared that and that's um, extremely generous. Uh, it's, it's not true. Carl Coffey was very unique in the way he did that. And most of us, uh, whether we're conscious of it or not, perhaps maybe copy some of the format and things and stuff. Uh, it was very unique, but I was never the same after, after reading his books. They juiced me up so much. I was in Okatee two years after he was. I mean, I followed his foot pass. I went to Utah and caught then Deck Color, which is now Con Color on, you know, his trail. I, my famous favorite snake story 
uh, it came from Carl Caulfield's notes when I found something. So uh, certainly for my generation, a huge influence. You couldn't put that book down. That, the, you, that book, you just couldn't. You read the whole thing. And I have so many editions and copies in here. You know, um, I just I can't go anywhere. And if something's for sale, uh, you know, it, it's some um, uh, Linda goes, really? What do we have? 37 copies. <laughs> we have 38 now. You know. So anyway, um, uh, yeah, really, really a very original book that, that really got juices going. And, and then, of course, on the other side, my, my other ones were um, Clobber's Rattlesnake books, which were iconic. And I memorized everything in those. And 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 to this day, and I'm modeling some of the Pitch You Office book, um, after these books, because I just love the format, we're right and right. So the the handbooks of right and right, everybody should have names have changed, genius, which the whole difference. So it drives me absolutely crazy, and I can't, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't keep up with Morse, which I don't try to, <laughs> and and I can't keep up. I'm still calling stuff Bufo, and it's changed two or three times. I think Bufo's and, gone. And yeah, say, you, you do realize that that's no longer, and I go. I, I really don't care. Just tell me what. <laughs> I, I you know don't, what I'm talking I, about. I can't. I, can, I just. I just mentally can't. I'm not Harry Green. Never will be. Not even a part of it. You know, Harry Green can look at something, and that's why he's Harry Green. Uh, that's not me. Uh, you know, every time something changes, I go, "Damn it, man! Why did you do that?" And then, you know, in some things like we talk about. You know, change in Everglades rat snake. You know, mm. it was an Everglades rat snake. You know, it was an Everglades. Generally speaking, a black rat snake must be black. You know, <laughs> and and you know, I, I mean, there was some. It told you common nomenclature. So now, now we have the eastern rat snake, which tells you nothing, <laughs> right? And right. and so all this stuff kind of drives me crazy. It doesn't matter what, what I think. So I just tell people, I go, it really doesn't really matter. Tell me where the animal's from. What does it look like? And that, that's that's what tells you something, you know. So that's a line from Gary Keyser. It's always really good. Gary always says, well, no, I don't care. Just tell me where it's from. <laughs> so he's a, a, a great Rosie Bell guy, probably knows more than anybody. And and when we talk about localities and stuff, he goes, well, I, don't, I don't care what you're going to call it or cut eye <laughs> or whatever we've changed. Just tell me where it's from. You know? so, <laughs> yeah, something to say. Keep it, keep it simple. Yeah, I like yeah, it. Her herpetolo- don't like to listen to what I, my babble. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm an avocational herpetologist at best, certainly not a professional one, and I'm proud to be a herpetoculturist and uh, and um, proud to have that passion for all that stuff. Definitely. So, is there a species that you were hoping to find throughout all of your herping? Yes. You just were not able to tick off your list. No, and it drives me nuts. <laughs> it drives me. Well, first of all, let me be real clear here. Yeah. Because I wrote a chapter about Alterna, mm. and I read Alterna early, and a lot of them, and I have pictures all around about Alterna. My name gets associated. I, mm-hmm. want, I want to say this again. I said last time, I'm the world's worst Alterna collector. I lived there for 10 years, and I found a small handful where people go out and find two. They come down from New York in one night, mm. you know, and it's just what it is. I mean, I've on other things, I've done well. But it's just one of my things. But something I would love to have found, uh, I found two dead specimens, both in orange groves, it are short-tailed snakes, which are now Lampropeltus. Mm-hmm. They're a king snake. And... Um, uh, a uh, very, very long snake, you know, a little short tail, um, very strange snake and uh, very sandy mid Florida environments. So I found two dead, uh, you know, on sandy roads in orange groves, but I'd love to find one. And, and of course, uh, Keith will relate to this, uh, you know, who wouldn't, but uh, uh, I would have loved to have been able to go over and, and at least find and see a round island boa. You know, it's a very yeah. cool, viperine-looking, cool thing. Yeah. They're, they're working with trying to reestablish on a couple other islands, and you know, the numbers are not good, uh, yeah. probably sustainable. But, of course, with part of our industry, if nobody has it, they want to get it by any means. But 
Hopefully that's not yeah. the case, but w- would love to, you know, stumble across something like that. And I, we all have that stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't Don't really lie. tell you the truth. Round Island boa sounds really good for this program. <laughs> a short tail <laughs> snake, because they're really rare. I can't just tell you my real thing. I'd like to find a garter snake. And, you know, <laughs> a snake. And I, I, I'm, I'm, a ter- I'm a terrible collector. It's just, it, it's like. I'm just old, so the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I think it doesn't matter what it is because I mean I'll, I'll be mowing my lawn and an American toad will start hopping across my lawn. Lawn mowers stopped in the middle of the yard, half done. I'm running after a toad. Oh, like, yeah, sure. and my wife's like, "What are you doing?" It's like it's the lawnmower's going down the hill now, and <laughs> I'm, I got a toad though. They're like, yeah, that, I think it doesn't matter what it is. So, well, I'll but that little story, anyway. that little story is to the point of this mm-hmm. of what you're doing here tonight. That little story here is you have a passion for all of that. And right. If you stop and look at uh, Carol and Ensis, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, and, and an old, uh, uh, and, and, and you stop and look at, at anything instead of the few people that say, oh, it's a junk snake and pushed off the road or this or that, it, it, it's, you either have that or you don't. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, you see that thing hopping across the thing. Not only do you get it out of your way, you pick it up. Of course, your hand, your hand is full of toad shit yeah, and everything else. But, but, but you're looking at it, right? Yeah. You're examining it and you're looking at it. And, you know, today we look at it and we go, wow, I think it's a morph. <laughs> oh, an American joke. This sunlight, I think it's a little greener. It should be. What are we going to call it? You know? yeah. so, God, no. A little yeah. dinker project, yeah. <laughs> so... In the same kind of vein, is there a spe- is there a favorite species that you found that was like this, this this find this this catches my favorite? Uh, yeah, at the time that goes back to the the um, uh, the Caulfield story. Um, his thing search for Subocularis, and I went out there to look for Subox uh, mm-hmm. by myself and on his notes, and went down to River Road. He left, he left me those notes, and it was 2 a.m. I had coffee, had a 63 pickup, and 50 bucks in my pocket. Not enough to get home, but I figured I'd meet maybe some snake guy and sell a snake. I don't know. I didn't mm-hmm. care. I just wanted to get out there. And it's 2 in the morning. I'm driving up and down, back and forth, and I'm not saying much. And this is a true story. And I stopped in the middle of the road, and I got out to wake up, and I screamed with my arms in the air, suey, suey, subak, you know, like suey, pig, pig, pig. as corny as you can get, as corny as you can get. And, and you know, out there, no shirt on, and all your screaming, suey, suey, subak. And I said, okay, I'll give it to him. And I turned the truck around to go back to Davis Mountain State Park. And what had crawled out behind the truck, 50 feet behind me, was a subak. Oh, yeah. A true story. And... I had that snake, and I stayed up until sunrise in the bathroom of Davis Mountain State Park, looking at that in my hands, shaking. You know, I, it just was and became a favorite snake, and I bred. Uh, and I, by the way, I have nothing bad to say about morphs because, actually, if Gregor Mendel was alive, he would say, this is terrific, and so it burned. Mm-hmm. You're just fast forwarding genes that are already there. So, mm-hmm. but but anyway, um, really got into subox. Still love them. Very unique snake, and that just that story will live on forever. And there there's others when you're this age. You have others, but that that one really stands out. I like that. I like that. Yeah. It's it's the weird herping stories of like getting out in the middle of the night just to scream your head off and like oh there it is. <laughs> like it's 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 just those are the those are the best herping stories in my opinion. Yeah, I think or, real quickly. Uh, uh, Louis Porras and Joe Baraducci, I think it was maybe Jerry Walls with them, I don't remember, but they were in the Chiricahuas and they were looking for triaspis for green rat snakes and didn't find anything. And so he said, hey, you two get together and take a picture. And Louis says, hold on a minute, let's include this triaspis, which they're not generally tree climbers, but it was in a bush and it was sitting right there next to him to take the picture. And they just looked for several days and here's a triaspis that made the picture. I mean, how, wow. good, how good is that story? Right? That's great. I love that. So, yeah, you got, you could write a book just on those stories. I love it. Yeah. yeah. See, you mentioned being in it for, for or in the hobby for so long. Uh, something we regularly talk about here is kind of avoiding the burnout where mm-hmm. you have too much snakes, you have too much stuff to do, mm-hmm. or 
that favorite animals of yours dies and that kind of goes right to the heart. And mm -hmm. a lot of times you see people get into it, get a ton of animals, a ton of stuff, and then they vacate it quickly. How have you been able to kind of avoid some of those pitfalls of burning out or pretty, pretty simple answer to that. Yeah. And a lot of people do get in mm. some just honestly get in because they're going to get rich overnight. Uh, l l let me give you a little hint out there. Don't ever quit your day job. <laughs> there, there, are, there are five of my friends that are millionaires, but they sell supplies and market things and mm -hmm. they're good businessmen. And it's, it's, it's rare. You can do that. And I have no problem with people. I don't so many, I sell some snakes in that I have left over in Daytona. I go to see everybody and I give away more rarely than I sell, but I have mm -hmm. nothing against that. But I, I think the answer to that question is, it goes back to your childhood. If you, my favorite word is passion. And I said in the last thing, if you're truly passionate and you understand that word, it never leaves you. So you don't just get in and get out. Mm -hmm. if something breaks your heart and you're still passionate. You go, well, I have to do better and figure out why. Or come to the understanding that, you know, well, well, first of all, here on that note is don't ever confuse a captive snake with with a wild snake. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we compare this all the time and we say it's not the same animal. They don't behave exactly the same the same way. They're in captive conditions. And you can argue that. Mm -hmm. Are we selfish putting the snake in a box? And I would probably say to you, yes, we are. But I'm comfortable with that. So I'm going to keep that snake in really good conditions, give it plenty of room, keep it clean. And it takes a lot of work. And if you have mm -hmm. 1,200 snakes, God bless you. You know, I would challenge that a lot of my friends, I'm their worst nightmare if I just show up and go, hey, man, let's look at the snakes. Not today, Craig. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty critical. And, yeah. um, you know, I mean, if you're going to do it, do it right or don't do it. And as right. far as the numbers go, it's challenging for me to take care of. Well, I always say I have 50 snakes. People ask me, you know, and I counted up for my permit the other day and I went, wow, <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. And I can't count, obviously, because I have 102. You know, how, <laughs> I mean, how did that happen? You know, yeah. I mean, and people are very generous when you're 74 and think you're going to die and they want something. They give you snakes. Right. And so. Um, but no, I you keep what you can manage. Stay passionate about what you have. If, if you hit a number where your that passion is waning, it's just it's too much. Mm. And it, and if the numbers are there because you're you're going to make it. And and look, I I love ball pythons. I like all snakes. I like it all. I, I, everything. But if you're in a show and and you know there's 50 people selling ball pythons for twelve hundred dollars, and and stuff, and and you look around at the looks on people's faces that their family depends on things and stuff. You know, it, it's it's a hard go. So uh, I would say, you know, only keep what you can take care of. Only keep what you love. Don't start putting the money thing to it. If, if you just like garter snakes, then keep them because it's a joy. You will love it. And you know what? Because you do that, there are garter snake guys and stuff, and they have a little business and do well because mm -hmm. that's what they love. But we, we've kind of turned the corner now. It's like, what's hot and what's not? And what morph? And I got to get those. And you really may not even like them, mm -hmm. you know, but don't do, that. don't do that. Keep what you love. And, and it makes it easier. And it helps you keep numbers down as well. You know, you can't, especially with the morphing today. I mean, yeah. Come on, Kevin. Kevin McCurdy. I mean, we, we get the new book coming out. We got 1,500. I mean, I don't. I bred ball pythons. We, we called them royal pythons, and they came in from Noah. Noah would send them in from Africa, and they'd have ticks on them, and they'd be five feet long. They were huge. You never see that today. And then no. I picked one out of a box once that looked a little light, and I called it a muted ball python. And I was going into the show, and Kevin Curley was a kid, and he was barefoot, and he comes running up, and he was aggravating. And he goes, Mr. Trumbauer, can I see that ball python? And, you know, I said, well, Kevin, let me go in and set up. And I said, oh, okay, okay. And I paid $35 for it. Just tell you what, you know, what a, what a sleazebag I am. 
I vote <laughs> guilty. I, I told Count, I always felt guilty about this, but he got yeah. the last lap. So I paid 35 and he goes, what do you want for that? I said, what's well, a muted ball python? So I just added a zero, 350. And he goes, okay. <laughs> I was shocked. And Linda was mad at me saying that. <laughs> 350, right? So fast forward four or five years, he comes over, and now it's not Mr. Trump. I said, Craig, come on over to the table. I go over to the table, and there's these hypo looking ball pythons. And guess how much they were? 35, added, 350, it, added a zero. 35 yeah. <laughs> and so, 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 you know. I am not the smart guy sometimes. <laughs> you know, certainly not a good business guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, awesome, though. Um, yeah. Do you, do you kind of feel sometimes that some people might get lost in the, the, the clout? They want to be known for breeding something, especially if it's something rare. I know Keith definitely has that problem with, you know, everybody wanting to do bull and eye and things like that. They want to have that. I don't think there's I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, I don't think that I think that's just a natural part of who we are. I mean, I like I'm old like old muscle cars. And, you know, my son's a captain in law enforcement. and I drive nuts and, you know, and I'm still tearing up the streets at 74 and stuff. And, and, you know, it's it's, um, you know, you know, getting off the track. But um, um, it's. I don't even know where I was going here. What was what was the question again? Uh, do you think that some people kind of want that the, the, to be yeah, famous yeah, yeah. Okay. for doing well, something? So, yeah. so, no, I think that's an, just an, a natural thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I told Keith I had Bolin's. Uh, Tracy sent them to me. They bred on Christmas Eve, and I woke up in the morning, and the male was dead. And, of course, Linda commented, and she goes, well, it's a pretty good lay, I guess, you know. And I'm, I'm bored. <laughs> I mean, there weren't any bullets over here, you know, and, and I called Tracy and I said, man, I, I don't know what to say, Tracy. I, I just don't know what happened here. And, you know, Tracy goes, oh, it's happened to us. Don't worry about it. I mean, they're really strange snakes. And I went, well, Jesus. thank goodness, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I have snakes that I've been very proud of that I've bred some will- rare willow dye and things at times. And, and I'm ecstatic and I let people know about it. And I'm mm-hmm. proud and I sound proud. And mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. I, you know, it's a challenge. And look, for those snakes that are hard, like Bolins and stuff, a lot of people give up, you know. Mm-hmm. But, but if you're passionate, you keep saying, I'm going to figure this thing out. You know, yeah. although there are some things it, it is, you can call it a day. There are certain species for some reason that I can't breed and mm-hmm. everybody else can breed them. And I just have to call it a day and say, I don't know. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Pick and choose the uh, thing. I, I, this year's my this will be my second year. Uh, I got white lip pythons last year. So this Love will be them. the year Absolutely. where it's like. This is the year I'm like, all right, well, now it's put up or shut up time. I need to repeat it. <laughs> like, otherwise, yeah. like, well, I could have just run into it. put up or shut up. It never yeah. works that way. As soon as you think you've had two good years of clutches and you're going to, you think you're getting that clutch, no. It, they're they're yeah. not going to produce for two years or something <laughs> for whatever reason. The wrench in the works. And, and here again, don't confuse <laughs> a wild diamond python and a captive diamond python. We yeah. think we have it figured out, but we don't. The herpetoculture has only scratched the surface. There's so many variables, bolins. I mean, you know, look, Ari went over there and, and taught us so much. Mm. You know, what a unique snake, uh, very unique environment and, and where they're found. And so we bring them back and we, what do we do? We match that. Well, that's the wrong word. You think you match that. Mm-hmm. You know, Ari didn't, and will admit that, that he didn't find out every variable there. So we're still learning and paying attention, but you know, keep them breathing. You know, you when you when you're that kind of person, you go, you get very disappointed, and you know how it is. You get in furrow or something, you go, I can't do this. This is yeah. just kicking me. Or you say, All right, well, I'm just I'll try it again. I'm gonna do things a little different. Sometimes you have to shake up what people are telling you. Mm-hmm. I have many Atticola skips and I. It's it's the rarest of the pituophis and the few people have had them say no they're they're absolutely fall breeders and and yeah that's true but Gary Kiesler's bred you know bred twice in the spring and I think mine will probably do that you know eventually too so captive versus wild 
sometimes you just have to shake the box up. Mm-hmm. Look, if you had infertiles one year and you shake, you shake it up and do something different, the worst that's going to happen, you're going to repeat last year when you were, quote, doing everything right. Right? Right, right. You're right. not going to do any worse. So, no. And, and right. sometimes you learn something because it's captivity. Mm-hmm. And don't don't ever confuse that. I just tell people it, there it's it's two different snakes. It's a captive snake and it's a wild snake. So, you know. Do you think that herping has kind of helped you kind of peg what you could be doing for your snake in captivity? Oh, like absolutely. You find it in the wild. Okay. Yeah, I'm mainly a crotalid guy most of my life. Rattlesnakes, mm-hmm. and I I brought rock back, exact rock. I mean, when I caught. You know, um, when I went to the Tanaos Altus Mountains, the TAs, and caught white speckled, you know, um, mm-hmm. well, truth be known, I didn't catch him. Gary caught. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible collector, but, uh, but but I brought back white granite. I put it in there. Does it make any difference? Probably not. I like the visual of that with the snake, yeah. and I I try to create an environment that I think is interesting for a snake. Um, and I also think certain snakes are at a kind of a different level. King cobras are extremely intelligent as far as snake intelligence goes. Mm-hmm. They, instead of eyeballing movement, they eyeball you. Mm-hmm. They make eye contact. You put something in a cage and they find it extremely interesting, you know? And so, um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I pay attention to surroundings where they are, and and instead of just grabbing something and moving on or photographing it, take a minute, you know. Those TA speckles are primarily ground bird feeders. So the ones that people have that aren't feeding, you know, I mean, I don't want to step on bird people, but <laughs> find a dead bird, if, you, know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. Uh, and, and try, you know, ground birds, because they're down at the bottom of the canyon. You know, the mice mm-hmm. are kind of up here, and there's mice and stuff down there. But we, we met a researcher out there who brought that to mind. And his stomach content survey showed, you know, like four birds and made sense. So, yeah, if you pay attention to the snake and where it is and what it's doing, sometimes you can you can figure it out. I mean, I bred chondro pythons, and notoriously hard to get some of them to feed when they're babies yeah. and everything. And um, uh, I talked to... Um, yeah, he was uh, Cooper Walsh, I think it was, and um, um, and somebody, I think Louis suggested that we'll, we'll take a bird's nest, an old bird's nest, and wet that pink and just rub it at the bottom of the bird's nest. And I had six baby condors that weren't feeding. Every one of them jumped off that little twig and nailed that thing. So, you know, when you pay attention to that and yeah. do that, it just completes the thing. So if you're not breeding something, put all that information in there. And, you know, um, Key, Key's good at that. That's why he's successful. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. uh, really, really. Um, we keep him around for his uh, out-of-the-box thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his out-of-the-box looks, maybe. You know? I mean, yeah, that too. <laughs> He's got that New Jersey thing going there, doesn't he, you know? The little, so, little yeah. push room. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> you just hope I find another Alan Pelley one day. I'm a big Springsteen fan, so I can't, I can't not, I can't not <laughs> Jersey too bad, you know? <laughs> Uh, I, I I am just I, I keep Keith around because while we were all walking and looking this way, he looked up and saw the snake. Yeah, so yeah, that's why we keep that's why we keep Keith around. Yeah, if so. you're looking down for three hours and see nothing, you look, you try know. looking somewhere else. Actually, Craig, I tripped and as I was falling, I just happened to be looking up yeah. and yeah. saw the snake. Catch I don't yourself. That. I, th- I think you're smarter than most of us, and probably. That. <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't. I think I'm a leader. I'm a follower. You know, we're walking down a trail, and everybody looks up. I look up. You know. So. <laughs> uh, God, it's great. Um, so it, it, we kind of find, especially now that that certain herpers are addicted to the chase. You mm-hmm. know, you always want to add the new thing to your collection. The new, of course, sure. snake morph, whatever. Can you, like, do you kind of want to, do you have any insight on how people can almost appreciate the stuff that they have 
already in their collection because it almost seems like people get it. They're obsessed with it until they get it. And then it's just stick it in a cage on to the next thing. Yeah. And there's a lot of that. And especially with the morph thing, you know, oh, I can't wait to get this morph. And now there's a new morph and I have to have that morph. And and by the way, um, I I have nothing against morphs and Mm -hmm. I love ball python people. I, I like it all. So but there is something to that. And you you need to slow that pace down a minute and and, you know, enjoy what you have. And that that 15 minutes of fame for that snake that you just got and then it wanes and you have to look for something else. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of that in everybody. You know, you go to one snake show and then you go to the next one. Oh, I got to have that pair. Um, And I'm not really sure what that's all about. I think it's kind of a collector's thing. It's not just snakes. You collect. Linda collects fiesta wear and plates and things. And mm-hmm. I think we all get a little bit of that and stuff, but they can be dangerous. You wind up with too many snakes and you, you're really not appreciated. Look, if you're a morph person, appreciate that morph. Don't take a look at it for yeah. five minutes and say, God, I can hardly wait to make a different morph. I mean, that's just my take on it. I, I guess that's not wrong to go the other way, but uh we do have a sense of extravagance in that people have to have everything, every morph, the next one, the next hot thing. And, and that's, that's the side of herpetoculture when, when the advent of, of selling snakes, which was very mm-hmm. foreign to us in the beginning. We, the idea that you could sell a snake, we looked each other and laughed. And the first snake show we ever heard of, we went, well, how does that work? I mean, the first, <laughs> the first one I went to, I, I, went, I just had a box of some baby alternative. I mean, what are, what are these cups? I mean, what? How do you do this? I mean, <laughs> it was so foreign, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't know, but but it's it's gotten a little a little crazy. What's hot? What's not? What's driving the market? And you go around and you hear people. I never pay attention, to it, and they go, "Yeah, colubrids are dead. Ball pythons uh-huh. are dead. Crashing. Uh, there's yeah. forty three thousand of them for sale on the world market or whatever, and it's all dead. And it's not about that." It's about mm-hmm. you, friend. If you're sitting there and you're passionate about what you have and you can sell that passion to people and why and everything else, and it's what you really love, trust me, you'll be successful. If you're just following what you think the trends are, and trust me, you know, just if keep what you have and, mm-hmm. and sell that. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's the end of the – I've been hearing it's the end of the ball python thing. I mean, I don't have ball pythons, but – the end of the ball python thing for nine years, you know, and you would think <laughs> so. Some You go to a show and there's 48 tables of ball pythons and, and you say, well, you know, how does this work? Mm-hmm. Uh, the guy's got to sell at least one. And usually they're selling amongst themselves. It's a it's a high end animal. And right. most people at a show or they're looking and they're not going to spend that. So um, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, I don't pay attention to that. I just keep the things I love and then sell what I love about them. I mean, as far as, you know, why I like those snakes and it seems to work. Cool. Very good. Um, have you seen like shows evolving over time? Like what was that like kind of see? Cause I know it started with the box and uh, Alterna and then, deli cups and then acrylic displays and oh hey somebody's hey, hey pal, i got all <laughs> yeah. in. i i didn't i didn't buy that stuff i got the shop and i made stuff man i made okay. wood and stuff and i <laughs> i didn't have uh cloth behind me i had that i transported big plywood poly back things i set up with stands pain in the butt to set up and big <laughs> pictures i got all in on that stuff and um and I, I thought it was great. I still think it's good. I walk around and watch things evolving, and I don't see a problem with it. I don't. I know so many people do. Here again, it's a subject of snakes, but um, I don't see a problem with it. And the new generation is taking up a different notch. There's better lights, and there's things you never imagined. I mean, each show certainly mm-hmm. eventually got bigger and better because you, oh yeah, man, we need to add some lights, and you know, and and. I mean, Linda was doing little things, and I mean, you know, it was all the marketing thing, and I mean, it was a kind of a fun time. I mean, 
Now you can buy everything, and, and it's become a homogenous blend that everything kind of looks the same. Right. And I, so I, I always stop at that unique, the one table. I always use an example. At one show, I stopped, and I looked down as a kid, and I went, wow, what's your story? Yeah, I'm just a student. I go, these are all, of course, I call them keeled green snakes. They're rough green snakes, you know. And they were like three generations. They were babies, and they were yearlings, but nothing but green snakes. And I went, this is the coolest thing in the whole show. You know, I said, that's all you do is green snakes. I go, I love green snakes, man. I breed them. And I go, this is the coolest thing in the whole show. <laughs> so he gives me two green snakes. I walk back to him and Linda goes, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> caterpillar eaters and <laughs> i took a back game back i you know i mean i mean thank you so much but because it was such a cool thing right yeah and the kid was just passionate he did and they were they were like 25 dollars or something i mean it wasn't there for that he just th- that's really what it's all about you know you walk around see the same and the same and the same and the same and and that's okay i guess mm-hmm. you know you don't have to go to a show but it's 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 kind of nice to see something like that. And that's where the more thing comes in. I mean, like I look at ball pythons. I go and look at all of them. People go, you're not going to go look at ball pythons. I go, why wouldn't I? And I go look at them and I look at a color, this, you know, shark repellent orange pair of ball pythons. And I'm trying to figure out how in the world do chromatophores and things make that color? I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. it's not even, you don't even see it. Yeah, in nature. I'm fascinated. Of course, then the thing in me kicks in. I go, oh, well, they're only $3,500. I think I'll buy that pair. <laughs> and luckily, at 74, I don't. But, yeah, you know, so, um, I mean. Yeah, One thing I'd like to add about the show's aspect is when Craig was doing Orlando and then became Daytona, when you walked, he was an, you were usually an end cap. I was, and, yeah. And, and it always felt like you were in Texas when you yep. saw it. Just the way he set his table up, like it was, I don't know I don't know how to explain it, but it just had a Texas aura about the, the, the end cap, you know what I mean? You're the only one that would have noticed that. But we, I, we had high-end Mexican blankets, and everything was wood, and it was a very kind of a different-looking theme. It just evolved that way before I moved to Texas. But uh, it, it worked for us. I mean, I I in, enjoyed making that and doing that you know so yeah. uh, you're the only one to have ever noticed that case <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it was cool speaking of that let's and i know we talked about this the first time we had you on the show a little bit but um let's talk let's talk some specific herping areas meaning uh, states wise you know or whatever and whatever level of depth uh you're comfortable going into or want to go into in this context. We all know uh, in Carl's books, you know, that he went very specifically, and it's sort of amazing the the stuff that's still there, considering, you know, that's been around as a resource for 65, 70 years. Yeah, um, sure, sure. But, and highly, uh, highly criticized for that, as you know, which which was never his intent. He never dreamed that there'd be an oak tea explosion. And, um, um, you know, things have shifted but i will i will also tell you that plantation owners have gotten smarter they don't particularly want snake hunters there although there are still people there that i know that would allow us to go on if we did and they'll say things like don't take my king snakes you can take a cane break if you want but i don't take anything i mean that most of the time you just mm-hmm. want to go but maybe the numbers have been influenced and i'm sure they have it's like the cane fields, you know, in Florida and stuff. There are just so many kings in that day. You couldn't walk a canal back and not find three or four. You'd end up 10 or 12 at the end of the day if you were keeping them. Same thing with Paynes Prairie. They haven't seen king snakes in years, and I caught four in one day, you know, there. Um, there's there's a lot to that, though. There's, there's fire ants. There's all kinds of different mm-hmm. things that have happened there. It's very complicated. It's not as simple as some of the answers and stuff. But, um, you know, my favorite places, I grew up in South Florida, so certainly the Everglades. I, I lived off the old Tamiami Trail. I mean, as far as hunting goes, I didn't live there. But um, Loop Road, all those things, I, I, I found the first Miami, quote, phase corns. I don't know where that came from. They were just, you know, these silver... <laughs> 
silver red things, you know, and mm-hmm. I said, oh, these are just great. And uh, they're still there where I collected, you know, and um, certainly loved the south uh, part of that. So many stories there. Of course, I lived in West Texas, uh, right in the heart of everything uh, for 10 years. And, and being a rattlesnake guy, I was very passionate about that area and done a lot of California, uh, especially thanks to Gary Kiesler. So um, Utah. Uh, here again, you know, following some of Carl's notes was just a tremendous place. Fiery furnace going up there following notes. And it was a cool night and um, a lot of rattlesnakes left their tails crossing the road. You can see the rattles. So you kind of know it's a rattlesnake when you come up on it. And the only crowlet there was, you know, was con color, midget faded rattlesnakes. And I found four. That's all I found, you know, using those notes. So, so many memories here. I've gone back there. Uh, well, now it's a national park. It, back then, mm-hmm. it was you know it was different. And um, uh, golly, I you know um, I wrote about Wisconsin and and Illinois and um, uh, certainly been up in the Pine Barrens, uh, Keith. And you know you knew you, there, there's it's hard for me because when you leave your habitat that you may love, but you go to somewhere fresh, you go. This is really so foreign to me and so cool. And so neat, you know, um, but I've herped a lot of America. Um, there, there's hardly a state I, you know, I haven't been in. I spent four years in college in Kentucky looking for uh, the now famous, but back then rarely known Kentucky pine. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, it's the, the largest snakes I still have, thanks to Phil, Phil Peak, who, who's a friend who, by the way, is, is trying to establish something. He has good ties with the state. There's a lot of. Uh, of uh, work for the state in 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 numbers and, and things, but trying to reestablish that thing. So I'm I'm hoping to shove some babies his way from from mine. But I spent four years looking for Kentucky pines from old pickles at University of Kentucky, um, and and some rough data over near um, Mammoth Cave, which surrounds the area where 17 years it took you know Phil and um, and his and his buddy to to find one. I think they found three, but um, very rare snake, very pretty snake, uh, and remnant population up in North Alabama and Tennessee a little bit. But um, that's a kind of a favorite area, unsuccessful but favorite. Um, but uh, this guy's hard to nail because it's so exciting to go to someplace new. It's just like mm-hmm. when you go to a country, you go to Australia, you're just freaking out mm-hmm. because there, if you find anything, it's cool. There's nothing that you're going to find in Australia, insect-wise, anything that's not. You go, this this is crazy cool. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I was so, thinking over the mammals. So I was pointing out kangaroos to these guys, and they're like, "It's a kangaroo." I'm like, "No, that's a different one. That's a gray one. Like oh, that's like red, that's not a red one." Grays, yeah, <laughs> the wallabies. I mean, no, there's nothing there that's just not cool. And yeah, um, you know, my my daughter in law is from Australia, and she, she's just a a treasure and a beauty too. She's drop dead gorgeous. Aussie girl, but I, her family's always sending me pictures just out in their back garden. She goes, oh, look at this skinky, and it's a blue tongue. I'm going, that's in your garden? Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the part of me wants to go, hey, look, take this, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, um, you know, uh, kind of like Dick Dick Ross. You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to re- reveal anything, but. He you know, already you know, told us. When I was when he, 25, <laughs> I would have said, now, let me tell you. How are we going to get this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I, I I think it's like publications. After fifty years, you're you you're can't, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So uh, I did I did I did some crazy things. Not they're just laws and things were fuzzy. You just didn't know. You didn't think they were that bad. You didn't think of a bunch of it. I look back now and I go, man, you were crazy. Oof. <laughs> you got a Samsonite with a Burmese python, you know, the old hard Samsonites, and you'd have a little thing that you'd buckle up and thing. And I had a male and a female, you know, seven foot Burmese coiled up on each side, <laughs> plane, you know, before snakes on a plane came, came along. <laughs> you know, I, would I do that or recommend it today? Absolutely not. But, you know, at the time, you didn't know there weren't that many of us. You go, well, how am I going to get these here? And, you know, the LA Zoo wanted them. And, you know, I, I went, 
you know, okay, well, just, I'll put them in here, put them on the plane. I mean, mm. there wasn't any kind of particular, <laughs> you didn't know, but of course right. you look back and you go, well, man, you're crazy. That's just dumb stuff. <laughs> I, I would have think Dr. Ross told us he had a case full of ring pythons that he got onto a plane because he went and he did like a Doctors Without Borders in like Bismarck and just so happened to be there. And it's like, Jesus, like, are you? And he just like, no, he just shoves him in your suitcase and off you went. I'm like, okay. So, well, look, everybody has stories. Bill Lamar has <laughs> yeah. got a few famous stories that he wished they weren't out there. But, you know, and uh, we all have stories. Of course, Tommy's got stories. And, and you know, it, uh, it, that's too bad what happened and mm. maybe deserved or not. I don't know. I, I personally, uh, I see all the good in Tommy and, and I like Tommy. And the, 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 the big side of that is that it wasn't so much maybe Tommy. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's some zoos that when they wanted stuff, they mm-hmm. made things happen and, and just didn't get implicated, you know, for right. reasons, but, I know for sure that when I wanted something in a collection back before you could buy something, the only thing to do before the zoo agreements and everything, um, and they, they came together, uh, I went to zoos. I mean, you know, I got stuff. I got first Campbell Eye out of the Dallas Zoo and stuff. But it's because they wanted something that I had. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then rules got broken because they go, well, we, we need a pair of those. So, you know, and that's I. I worked with L.A. Zoo doing that, San Diego Zoo, Dallas Zoo and stuff and got stuff. And um, so, you know. So it goes Wild West. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah 100 percent. And it's kind of, uh, frankly, I think most, you know, relative to a lot of the stuff, right? We're in human convention. You know, it's just human laws. But I think we're kind of in a different sphere if we're saying, you know, yeah, one pair versus sort of the commercial exploitation, mass mm-hmm. exploitation of wildlife. Those are kind of two entirely different stories, right? Yeah. A hundred, hundred different shipments of a hundred animals is a lot different than one shipment of one pair. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm look, I'm, I'm really a proponent of conserving things and, and, and the way to do it is it's, it's to buy up land and mm-hmm. to buy a piece of pristine lands. And the, 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 to lose the self, you, you want to save bigger species and bigger things. You know, you buy a hundred thousand acres, and no photographers, nobody gets to go on it. You just you're satisfied knowing that they're there, they're undisturbed. Mm-hmm. It's there, and you've done that for them. That's hard to do for people, but I, I'm I, absolutely. Uh, but you know what we protect and what we don't protect is become a matter of money and politics and things for sure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we all know that. We see that in certain things. I mean, Florida's old law with gopher tortoises. I built a house, and right next to me was an active gopher tortoise colony, and they were going to build a house here. And I went, oh, you can't do that because it's an active gopher tortoise thing. And I came home, and it was all bulldozed, and I called Fish and Game. I was really mad. And so at the time, you could pay a fee, mm-hmm. and that would – allow you to develop it, you could bulldoze the colony. Where did the fee go to to protect the gopher tortoise? <laughs> so, you know, just idiotic stuff. And of course they've yeah. gotten a lot better. And I'm not knocking they 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 do a lot of things. They've obviously made some mistakes here recently, but um, you know, um yeah, and and you know, it it, it there's a bigger issue here. Uh, it's it's really the human element and human population. When I was born, you know, there was you know 150 million people in America. We were 375 now. You know, India's mm-hmm. in the billions, and and so um, there's land, there's feeding people, there's all kinds of other issues. So it's kind of getting harder and harder to rationalize for some little scrub lizard like out in. Texas in the middle of oil fields of protecting a big petroleum rich area for a little lizard. Uh, you know, I get that for people who don't care. We care. Mm-hmm. So there's so many issues. It's very complicated, but it doesn't mean you give up on, them, you know, and here again, it goes back to the subject matter. It's a subject of a snake or a lizard and just a general, I don't care as much about that, you know, as I yeah. do a har- harp seal. Or, or something else, you know. 
Yeah, 100 percent. One interesting thing that what you, what you said reminded me of, a kind of mixed feelings, right, is the basically the situation you described there in terms of um, private exclusion for um, conservation is the obscurest population in the Animas Mountains, where essentially that's basically they threw up some, you know, it's the old cattle ranch they owned by, what, Anheuser-Busch Air, now, now deceased. But yeah, I, I hunted that. You know, that whole deal. Suit. Yeah, a number of times. Yeah, you know, I, I, I totally, I don't know, a part of me is a little bit mixed feelings, right? There's protection there, but it's also then kind of a, a gatekeeping or, or whatever situation as well, which obviously cuts both ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it becomes complicated. Uh, they're getting, you know, the thing about Obscurus is drop Obscurus, make them Silas, you know, which they're kind of protected in Mexico and stuff. They're kind of manipulated some things. I don't know how you do that with species, some species and stuff. But uh, And, of course, uh, back then, um, it was Silas, then it became Obscurus, and 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 they were only in the Animus, and you know, behind the gate in the land, and it used to be uh, owned by, actually, uh, a, a uh, railroad owned that area and land uh, when I first went out there. And then, of course, the Palencios, you know, uh, they showed up in the Palencios and some other areas and stuff, but... Yeah, it's complicated. When you have Sky Islands out west and you have, you know, especially not just a, a morph or something, but you have a unique subspecies in a Sky Island separated by desert, it's only going to be in that island. It's not crossing that desert and heading somewhere else. So um, certainly parameters to protect certain things for sure. And as a herpetocultural community, we should, we should be on board for that. There's plenty of things for us to, to breed and do. And we should be okay with saying the Brazos River water snake is just in such a small area, just leave it alone. You know? Yeah. When I lived in San Francisco, I collected Tetratania pre-act. And, and not the, the most beautiful harvesting, very pretty, but certainly some of the red sideds in Oregon and stuff. But, but a beautiful snake, and it was found in five different areas. It's down to three areas, I think, now. Mm-hmm. And of course, protected and and should be. There's mm-hmm. there's three areas a matter of acres, you know, where where they're hanging on, and and one of them very public type area. So um, yeah, we should be on board for that. We should help that, and certainly you y- and everything. We should do our part to to try to promote that, to show where our head is. Really, it's not mm-hmm. just about grabbing snakes in the wild and and all that and we do do some of that we just need to do more mm-hmm. and we need we need more money we need people to realize that you don't get this thing for free yeah. and i said years ago if you want to protect the industry what you do is everybody chips in a thousand you know a year and they go a thousand dollars go look you can go sell a ball pipe for thirty five hundred dollars thousand a year now you raise thirty million dollars and you go to washington to a lobby firm Mm-hmm. where you have 100 lawyers. They don't care what the subject is. They learn about it. Mm-hmm. They go, oh, okay, it's snakes. They call Keith up and say, hey, you're on the payroll, and we need you to identify, and we're going to learn this stuff, and we're going to pay you this. And they do their homework, and then when a law comes up, uh, there's 10. This is how it works in America. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can debate the NRA one side or the other, and I'm not here to do that, but you have to respect the fact that at least they're very powerful, and it's because of money and they're lobbyists and they're attorneys. So you get 10 lawyers getting off a plane in three-piece suits to challenge yeah. something in a state. The fishing game said, we don't have a budget for this on this thing. This is crazy. But, you know, we do the best we can, but it's not enough. And it's yeah. not, you start to follow everybody else do the best they can. It's the fact that, to be very honest, we're a cheap industry. <laughs> People don't want to do what they should do to protect their hobby and you know as well as I do, things are falling left and right like crazy. And yeah. they're getting very inventive on, on how to catch up with this. All this stuff about you know, Snake leaving a state to go to a show and all these other things. And um, so it's complicated. Yeah. It's- no doubt. I don't want to glide by the uh, opportunity of what you said there, especially uh, given it's so rare as we just highlighted. Can you talk about your when you went to the Animus with the LA Zoo? Yeah. How many times did you go? What was that? What's it like? I mean, I have no opportunity. Well, to I went twice. I went with Harvey. 
I went with Harvey Fisher, who was curator at the L.A. Zoo. Mm -hmm. And we went out there. He, he got permission from the railroad. There was a guy that lived up there, and there was a gate. And we went up this rocky road, and you open the gate, and, and then you drop down into Indian Canyon. And, you know, if you hunt leps and stuff, you, you start to understand where they are and where they aren't. Um, we never found one. I found some really cool lepidus. Um, we never found one on that trip. The next trip I didn't go, and they found two. Um, very unique, unique area. Um, uh, in fact, I didn't drink enough fluid. I collapsed out there. I was dehydrated <laughs> and, you know, out in the middle of nowhere back then. I mean, there was nothing anywhere. Still pretty remote. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a great day and such a, such a new thing, man. You know, and the, of course, then there was Silas, and then it was obscure. And the ranges changed. You know, you didn't know. You know, they're only found here in this one canyon. Well, they're they're not. There are several other canyons, and then the Palencios showed them and and stuff. But uh, very exciting stuff. I mean, you know. Um, but uh, here again, Harvey would have been better suited not to take me. Mm. The, the, not the rabbit's foot of good luck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty good at telling some humorous stories, but that's not why you're there, you know, so uh, I would I would rather have the Willard Eye than, than the Trumbauer, so you know. <laughs> is, the, is the habitat there different from that in the Palencios, or was it definitionally different? Well, surprises I, you that I they're think elsewhere? I spent a lot of time up there near the chair cars. Bob Ashley's a pretty good friend. I've been up and down um, you know, the Palencias and, and Chiricahuas are, are a little bit more dramatic in areas. The Animus has kind of one peak, Animus Peak, and then there's just alluvial fans and canyons. Uh, I, I don't think it's as dramatic. Of course, Palencias aren't quite like the Chiricahuas either, but, um, it, it, you know, there wasn't much to that canyon. I mean, it wasn't like some deep, dark ravine. You started off and the canyon just got bigger with walls on it and you just you walk the canyon came back up into a pasture and then there was you know a peak and a mountain in front of you um but when you know will die very will die typical yeah. will die it's like the watchukas and will die will die and stuff um but uh uh yeah and uh, you take it for granted at the time because you never know and i look back now and i i think it's really a cool place and um, you know, of course, you're young, you're older, you're convinced that, oh, I'd find them now. I'd come out of there with a dozen, you know, for the zoo. <laughs> of, course, of course you would. Now I can't even see. So, you know, I mean, uh, barely. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I love that time. And, and those that that area is kind of unique. Uh, it's kind of a wasteland around there. It's not much there. A little town of animus is. A little town of animals. I mean, yeah, you know, there's not much there, and still not much there. So, yeah, one hundred percent. And speaking of that area, um, have you found price sign? Uh, not there. No. no. Right. Sure. 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 Yeah, not there. But just in general, I know on our last trip to uh, Arizona, um, we didn't. You know, we put in a fair bit of work for them, but uh, you didn't get high. Couldn't pull it off. Did you get high? You got to go high. Yeah, we get high. But so I, mean, I think go we, high. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting high would be kind of productive. Yeah, right. <laughs> go high, but uh, <laughs> you know, um, they're they're really up there. They're, they're those little boogers are very different. Of course, heads look different. Everything else, they're a high elevation snake, and they're they're um, they're like a, a, a quillis and. And some of the triceratus and stuff that and some of that stuff gets up to 14,000 feet. But most of the time people looking for price. Of course, now there's so much information just on your phone, but mm -hmm. um, you, you really want to get one of those ranchers and get permission, be nice to them and be polite, and, you know, tell them what you're doing. And sometimes they'll allow you to go there. And a lot of that is still ranch land with large acreage that covers those areas. And I was very lucky in West Texas to, I knew a lot of ranchers with 80,000 acre ranches and things. And Jeez. we had the privilege to go and see landscapes and, and places that nobody else is going to see because you're not allowed on there. And, 
uh, all surrounding Big Bend National Park and saw some incredible animals, snakes and things down there. So I feel very fortunate. But, um, you know, sometimes when you want to go there, uh, it doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, Lady Years in Okatee, I went out and um, I just simply, you know, rang a gate thing and a gatekeeper came from a little house and it was an old man. And I just I'm just honest. I said, we want to go out and I said, I need to pair up a cane break rattlesnake, but I, I didn't want to take anything else. And we hit it off really good. And, and for every year we went there, he would leave me the key on the gates and say, lock it up when you come out. And we were back there with nobody there. And sometimes if you are nice and it, you know, I, I bring him a little bottle of something special. And, um, and you know, it's common sense. I mean, be mm-hmm. nice and ask and all the Somebody can say the worst thing. Somebody says, no, get the hell out of here. And if that hurts your feelings, I mean, you're a snake guy. So, you know, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, if you ask and respect somebody's property, the, the, the problem with Okatee is the lack of respect for property. People started coming in and started knocking things down and they didn't put stuff back and they're trashing stuff and leaving stuff. And, you know, and there was, there was a, there were a lot of people down there and stuff, but, uh, you know, there's still, a lot of private land in Mexico is mostly private land in New Mexico. And, but it doesn't hurt it to get in touch. And you can, there's other ways to get in touch with them. And sometimes these guys are really nice guys. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of area to discover. It's a big country. We, we, mm-hmm. we say we have a huge population thing, but, I mean, what do we like, 17% developed or something? There's a lot of land out here still. And uh, a lot of cool snakes, a lot of variations and stuff, but you just got to, you got to go and get out there, which sometimes is a little problem when you have to make a living and you have a family. So, you mm-hmm. know. But uh, uh, I would encourage people to ask and be honest and then respect that property. And um, maybe you'll start a friendship that uh, will help you out in the future and you'll be able to get on that land. Great stuff. Bouncing back to your con color experience, because we're, at least uh, myself, Eric, a, a handful of folks affiliated with with the show are heading out to Utah here in oh, a month or so mm-hmm. um, with that being one of the targets on the front end of the trip. So when you were seeing them, were they hanging out under ledges? Were they out in the open? Were you seeing them at night? At, at I will tell you what I, uh, I had notes from him, from, from Carl. And it, back then it was, um, um, it was a monument. It wasn't a national park. And um, we, we, uh, if if you go to um, um, yeah, I slipped my mind. What's what's the town there and the monument? Um, um, oh, out by either Moab or Blanding. Or- yeah, yeah. If you go to the town of Moab, uh, mm-hmm. and you can mm-hmm. you can stay there, and then you drive now. It's a national park, so you really you can't collect. But I mean, if you want to find them, uh, uh, you know, um, gosh, June, July. Sun goes down. You just there's one road, you know, uh, uh, up to the peaks and and the red rocks and everything that if people go to, Arches National Monument. That's what I was trying to think of, and it's Arches National Park now. And there's one road that goes up there, and I just drove up there and drove slow. And if you if you uh, see a crowded crossing road, it's got to be a con color. And um, um, Lucky enough to find three you know, all in about an hour and a half. And it was like 58, 57 degrees. They're kind of a, a cold weather rattlesnake. Mm. Um, they're, they're out and it's cool. I mean, you would think you're in a flannel shirt going, well, this sucks, but I'm here. I guess I'll drive up and back. And, um, and uh, they're, they're still there, you know, in numbers. So I can't say I found any in the day, although I looked, but uh, boy, nighttime I, I did. So uh, they're a road crawler. If you you find some pavement and you know, you know put a little bit of time in, I think I hunted from about seven to midnight or something, and and found three. I left two, and uh, uh, I did take one, and uh, um, it was a a neonate, but um, still have you know pictures somewhere. But uh, a very cool little rattlesnake and. A lot of the, all of those things, the Panama and all those things have been changed. Uh, there's different thoughts on them. And, you know, uh, that whole Viridis complex is very interesting to me. 
mm-hmm. um, and separated like sky islands and deserts and things and stuff. And um, some of those little rascals are really beautiful, you know, very cool snakes. Yeah. Do you have a favorite rattlesnake? Both kind of run through both things. One for as a captive animal, as a species, and uh, to find in the wild, or as sort of a just overall favorite. Well, as a captive, uh, you know, I've had all the lepidus, uh, maculosus, mulus, all those things. Uh, lepidus, I think you can set up rock tiers and stuff, and they're really cool captives. They stay coiled. You give them heat, and they eat. Of course, well or die. Kind of the same thing. But my fa- my favorite and one of my top five favorite snakes are eastern diamondbacks. I had a lot of them. I had them from the Keys. Uh, I had a lot of different morphs that were naturally collected that I could have bought a home for for what I paid from <laughs> people who <laughs> decided you could make money selling an albino or this or that. And of course, the coolest snake I ever saw in my life was Snowflake. Uh, Bill loves, you know, loose yeah. system. Eastern Diamondback, uh, yeah. a very, very unique snake um, and, and just a gorgeous snake. I almost almost got that snake and uh, I didn't. But, uh, you know, I think in my book, I'm holding a, a huge azanthic, well over seven feet. Um, but hands down, my favorite rattlesnake. Uh, not an easy captive because I, I kept them in seven, eight foot cages and um, and I bred them and um, um but a very, very interesting uh, kind of a, in, I don't know about using word intelligent, but a very smart snake, you know, mm. uh, and uh, certainly one of my favorites. So, um, and so many stories, you know, in Florida and some very scary stories, you know, uh, uh, to boot. Um, so, but the, uh, and they're still here, uh, thank goodness, for a big snake. You know, um, you, you, the Florida gets chopped up more and more, and it's a little harder for big snakes. But they're yeah. still here in fair numbers, which is 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 a good thing. You know, uh, it, it, yeah, wouldn't, gonna... it wouldn't hurt my feelings to protect them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably not going to happen um, here again. The subject of a big rattlesnake, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> um, so, um, but um, yeah, I just. Uh, uh, I love Eastern Diamondback. That's great. Yeah, we're going to try and give it a go in October. So any insight you have into that in terms of, well, you know, um, in Florida. <laughs> ideation around, yeah, habitat or habitat types, meaning, or and even, heck, I mean, this is the point of the show. Feel free to go into any of that, those stories that you had around it. And, you know, what made it scary? People almost stepping on them or? Well, I yeah, it depends on where you want to go. I mean. Mm. My old friend who's dead now, Hayward Clamp, who, you know, a lot of people say, well, a commercial collector here. And then Hayward was a very intelligent, very smart guy and, and also didn't do as much raping of the lands as people think. But uh, he had access. There's a couple of islands, and I, and I think Harry Green was out on one of those. There's several barrier islands out there that have quite a few eastern diamondbacks, and it's pretty cool to hunt. Yeah. So if you're looking along that coastline for barrier islands, and the same thing, there, there if you contact me, I, there's a few um, islands. The Keys, to me, were the population I love the most. Uh, kind of smaller, not very attractive, more gray, you know, than the, than the yellow and stuff. Um, very, very kind of different. Uh, but there's, there's still um, uh, some of the larger Keys and a couple of the Cabbage Keys that still have those out there. But as far as Eastern Diamondbacks and looking, I mean, they're certainly down near the glades and, and, you know, in South Florida. But I think you have more luck if you stay up towards from Gainesville up into South Georgia. Um, You know, where I live, um, you know, there's a healthy population over Madison County, one county over. And uh, it's... uh, um, Fine, go for tortoise burrows. You know, fine. It's a it's a good way. You know, carry a little mirror and uh, shine that little light down there and those things. Be careful, don't stick your face down there. <laughs> Just reach in there, Keith. Well, okay? that was a story. I actually went down and did that with a mirror as as Geb um, hooked a four and a half foot Eastern Diamondback coiled on top of the burrow. It was like oh. a little berm. And I didn't look at the top. I'm looking in the hole. And I got my head down there, and I lift my head up, and I see this hook just 
eight inches from my face whip this Eastern Ivy. Back. You know, it would have been a head, a head shot. You know? I mean, I've been, I'm not proud to say, you know, bitten five times and one was serious. And, mm. uh, you know, you can rationalize by saying, well, you know, 60 years. I mean, it's not too bad. It, it, it is bad. It, mm-hmm. If you get bitten, it's your fault. And for all the people who have to make it to Facebook, um, you know, holding stuff today should know better. And I'm guilty. I even have a picture of my book. It, it, you know, I'm tailing a big Asian diamond back. But uh, I say, of course, here again, I'm breaking the rules. I say, well, I knew the snake. I raised the snake. And you don't know the snake. As soon as you trust the snake, you're going to get bit. Yeah. And I have a lot of stories. And uh, I'm a registered nurse. I help treat snake bites. I have all the protocols, Sean Bushes and everything else. And I know mm-hmm. how to give IVs and do all that kind of stuff. And and everything else, and if you get bit, it's your fault. It should never happen. You're breaking protocol. You're breaking thing. You know the rules, and it's not the snake's fault. It's your fault. And by the way, it's no no badge of pride or courage. It's a badge of dumbass. So when somebody's bragging and saying, "Hey, man, I've been bitten three times," you know, you're dumbass three times, and I'm a dumbass five times. We have yeah. that on a shirt, like just like it. Craig Trumbrower's badge of dumbass on a t-shirt. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a good t-shirt for to wear. I mean, I would wear that t-shirt. I, wear that t-shirt. I, I have way, some new product with, line we're going to go through for the show, and I'll let you know. We'll send you yeah, one if we can go through uh, it. it. It would probably sell well, you know. <laughs> so, you know, especially for the haters, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I hope I don't have a lot of haters. But, um, uh, you know, and, and to that point, you know, people – it's something about reptile people. You know, you, you put a syringe in their hand and and somebody gives some flagell to a snake and all of a sudden they're this medical expert. It's just crazy about hurt people. You know, yes. dose I, I, I've done this for, I gave chemotherapy for years and stuff and I break dosage. People don't even know how to dose. They don't know how to convert. They don't know how to do that. And it's not a criticism. Mm. You just don't. It's like, hey, Bob, how much is this uh, flagell? Well, I don't know. That looks like about enough. And, you know, or... Uh, you know, some of the cyclosporins, you blow a kidney in a snake, they don't even know that. So so all these medications in the hands of herpetoculture are not a good thing. Yeah. And, and I will tell you, don't just prophylactically treat snakes. Mm-hmm. It's the last thing you do. And these antibiotics and cyclosporins and all these different things were made for human beings. Mm-hmm. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, ectotherms and things. And there's a difference. And um, and there's a lot that goes into it. So you need to go to a vet who's experienced in dealing with those. And you don't have to go all the time. I'm very conservative. Egg yeah, bound, yeah. everything else. Most of the time, it's like, take a deep breath. You know, at home, a snake's egg bound, man. I, you know, it's been eight hours. <laughs> I've let a few snakes go until the next year. And when they ovulate, the first egg out is that one that's been sitting up there for a while that you could palpate. Now, there's mm-hmm. some obvious ones, and you can't aspirate those if you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But you can also ligate some of the renal veins very easily by, you know, hey, Bob, give me that 16-gauge needle. Where do you put it? Yeah, right there. Right here. You yeah. Know? yeah. And you go, look, I got I got the fluid. It passed the egg, and then the snake dies. And, you know, you go, well, yeah, you just ligated a vessel inside stuff. So, oh, yeah. Let's back off on the vet thing, all of us, and and be conservative Mm -hmm. and take care of your snakes, you know. And uh, if it comes down to needing something like that, be very conservative with it to do it. So everybody has a cabinet for that stuff. You know, we're all all really really (laughs) Hey, I got a syringe. This is very cool. I'm going to stick my I got got horse dosage. um, (laughs) I got got a vial of horse um, uh, antibiotics. How much do I give to my snake? Oh, my God. Like, yeah. Well, well, no, that's I know that's a (laughs) funny thing. But you hit it. It's a great comparison. Mm -hmm. It's 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 like, you know, when we start using flagell, um, you know, flagell is basically you'd go down to Mexico because you could get it without a prescription. (laughs) And it's used down there for dysentery and diarrhea and. And, you know, it kills protozoa and kills certain things. And, you know, I, I can remember a, a bunch of uh, 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 flower snakes, uh, Mullendorfi, that came in and, and go, uh, came in, and, and I'm not going to say who, but they had a big caulking gun and full of flagell. 
and they're sticking a the caulking gun tube down and says, how much? You know, just give it two clicks. Holy click, hell. Click, and, and pulling it out, and, you know, five Mullendorf I, and they go, yeah, because they come in heavily parasitized. Um, I will guarantee you those are five dead Mullendorf <laughs> Jesus. Five. So, you know, and I, I, I'm just saying it. Mm-hmm. Uh, people don't mean to do that, obviously, but um, l- l- let's – Let's let's leave it to, to somebody who really knows what they're doing and and um, and be a little bit conservative on that. So definitely. Yeah, that's great. Do you have I guess we'll start transitioning through our final questions here. Do you yeah. have um, a favorite herping story, Craig? Golly. Um, I look through your questions. I, I got something down here. Um well, you know, I, I have to say that little subox story I told you down there is certainly something that lives. I, I at seventy four, I, I really I have so so many, um, and and you know most of them. Well, you know my Alterna, I'm the world's worst Alterna collector, and I dragged my kids out on the Pandale dirt road back before there were any Alterna collectors hardly, and out in the middle of the night, and you know and. Wore that road out, and I came up over a hill, and the thunderstorms built, and then I come down, and there's a snake crossing the road, and I got so excited. I had a, an old Isuzu box trooper, right? Mm-hmm. And I put four, they're small. I put four kids in the back. Of course, you know, no seatbelts, and we didn't go to Disney World. They went with us out there, and, you know, they didn't even have room to, you know, poor kids. It's, uh, uh, they're all screwed up. No, they're no, they're not. They're great <laughs> kids, and they're great kids. They're all success. They're all successful, and and they they actually fondly remember at least part of it. But I come over that hill and I put the brake on and I went. It's 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 you know, and I slid right over the top. The wheel didn't hit it, mm-hmm. but I didn't know that because I put my brakes on. And if you're ever out there on Pandale Pandale Dirt Road, is you know, very wide, very high, very down washes, slid over, and I got out, and I pulled out this 11-banded, the prettiest, pure Blair Morph-looking thing you ever saw. I bred, bred her. I got 130 babies out of her from a, another animal, and I took her out and let her go 10 years later right where I was caught. Huh. And, um, but, but what a story, because... The kids all woke up, and they knew that word, Alterna and Blair's. They couldn't go back to sleep, and they were slapping me on the back and celebrating. And, you know, and it sounds stupid, but it was it was so, so great. I was so jazzed, and it, it got blurred a little bit when I tell that story. That kid came down from New York, and he, he went out about 20 miles and found two. And it was a breeding pair, actually. Locked up over on the side of the road. He came back, and of course, everybody then, was, there were two motels to stay in, so everybody's telling stories every night, comparing stuff. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I don't know what the big deal is, man. He said, I just went down there and got these two and go, what? <laughs> and, you know, and, it, it, uh, little, and, and on, on, you know, the Eastern Range, it's more of kind of a Blair Eye type thing, and, you know, simple bands, and more alternates and triple alternates as you move west and that sort of thing. And these were two alternaphase that were just sliver vans and they were mating and, and, and he went back to New York and, you know, I mean, I, the stories like that, just yeah, it was crazy, you know? Mm-hmm. So when you do find something um, that you really work hard for and look for, it's, it's a wonderful story. I, I know of so many other people that have, you know, more interesting stories, but for me in search of finding all the rattlesnake to find them myself, I came short. I had them all in captivity one time, but mm. I didn't find all of them. But I found most species, subspecies uh, in the United States proper and had most of the uh, Mexican animals and things. And uh, later in life, it took a while to get uh, Salve and I um, and, and a few other things. And transversus was just being described. I didn't have transversus. But um, all of those Crotalic stories were special to me, you know, to find something. That, any target animal that you go out to look for that you mm-hmm. find is a very special story. Yeah. So, um, but the sub one's probably the greatest just because it's the, you know, Siri Siri sub and 
the dry heat, and I was just happy to be out there, but it's so disappointing. I turned the truck around, and it's like, what? <laughs> you know, what the, if you're not religious, you're religious then. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that God, moment, yeah. God just dropped that thing right behind my truck, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a favorite spot to herp, West Texas, Florida? Um, there's an area uh, not close to here over Madison County. I find it really fascinating. Uh, some very interesting things I like, but uh, I will have to be honest with you. And there's areas in California, certainly. I'm kind of a rosy bow and nut and, mm. and, and have quite a few, you know, different localities. But um, I, I will have to say my heart will always be in West Texas. I lived there 10 years in the middle of nowhere in a 100-year-old adobe. It was the best of everything. But it was time to come back and be with family. Mm. And closer to family, and and we're very happy here. But I don't compare the two. I have my cake and eat it too, and and left, and and you know. But but so many great stories out there, and it's so rich. The the problem is when you go out there with all these expectations, you know, you're very weather dependent. And if it's too dry or you hit a cold front, you just got to hit it right. If you mm. live there. You're going to find stuff, and it's just a fabulous desert. But it's it's hard to just go out there and find things, you know, that you say you want to find. Mm. But it's very, very rich, not only in herpetology, uh, but geology and so much stuff out there. So you could spend a lifetime. And, uh, yeah, so I would have to say it's still my favorite area. Awesome. I yeah. guess uh, the last one we got here is uh, what has been your biggest accomplishment in reptiles, in your opinion? Golly, I, I just I maybe maybe duration and <laughs> and the fact that I've had so many species and subspecies and and n- not not that that's a pat on the back. I was, just came up in a time where things became available in the right places in the right times animals you will never find today they would never be in a shop uh, laws have changed you you just couldn't get certain things and walk in a shop and find things i mean i've had a lot of bitus i've had schwartz eye i've had Schneid, i mean schneider eye uh Perengui eye i've bred them had babies raised them uh, a lot of bitus um um but but so many species and subspecies so that's not a contribution. That's maybe an accomplishment and not by design. It's just so unfortunate. And that's why I really love it all. I mean, when people say oh, I had this, I go, wow, no kidding. I haven't seen one of those in 10 years. Man, it's so cool. You know, where did you get it? Well, I, you know, I stuck it on my shirt and I brought it back from Australia. And I go, <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably the only way you could have had it, you know. But, yeah. Um, you know, so um, I don't encourage that by any means. But, um yeah, maybe you know, maybe that, and and I'm proud of the fact that um, my passion is is just as great today as it was when I went down to that creek and caught that ribbon snake. And um, I'm I don't know if that's something you can be proud of, but I'm I'm proud of it. I go to a show and I see stuff, and I every table and I go, man, I need a pair of those. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to give stuff. I gave Keith a couple of things. I'm trying to give stuff away, man. You know? <laughs> and, and, and you know, I can. I mean, I can hardly wait. I only go to Daytona now. I can hardly wait to go to Daytona because I'm going to go look at stuff. You know, which is you know. I mean, but I think that's a good thing. Yeah. You know. You know, Craig. I, I say that that passion for reptiles is born in, born in us, just like. Singing is a talent to somebody just like playing a musical instrument is a talent. It's, it's seeing reptiles for what they are. It's, it's our talent and it's something that we just have in us for the rest of our life. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to have all the academics, you know, uh, jump on me here. It's certainly, it's not a, a genetic thing, but it's, it's, it's certainly, um, uh, hold on a minute here. Um, I'm pushing something on my hmm. that I don't want. I'm pushing, but now you're back. So, <laughs> you know, me. But but I agree with you, Keith. It's it goes back to me looking at that eastern diamondback that my dad shot, and everybody else was disgusted and wow, and it's all that stuff. And all I saw 
was refracting light on yellow and black in a, in a complicated pattern mm-hmm. with with like a poem, a splash of red blood on it. And I never forgot that. And I said, that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Now, most people, you either have it or you don't, you know. Uh, and, but at a very early age, it's very interesting that I would look at something like that and, and see so much beauty in that. Right. And, and I think m- most of us that are, here again, the word passionate or really passionate uh, goes back to our childhood and, and just that fascination. You go to a zoo, I'm going to a reptile house. And, uh, you know, and it, today, and I'm not criticizing people, but today, you know, you have people that are 25 and 30, hey, I think I'm going to eat a couple snakes and breed snakes and stuff. And it's, there's something missing there. And uh, I'm sorry about that because it's, it's been a wonderful life for me. I, I look, I've had ups and downs and health problems and everything. I have not a damn complaint in the world. And, and a lot of it is because of, I've been able to, to look at something so beautiful and understand something on this planet, like a snake. And so many people, you know, my age, you go, well, I'm bored, man. You want to go play golf and nothing wrong with that. But, you know, hell no, man. I'm going to walk out my backyard and flip that piece of tin I put out, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, so I've, I've still got that in me and I hope it's there when I draw my last breath and I think it will be. And I'm so grateful for that um, mm-hmm. because uh, it for me, somebody gave me a gift and it got me through a tough childhood. Let me tell you, I could have. That's a whole different book. But uh, snakes have been the constant, you know, in my life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm very, very, very happy to just be privileged to be part of that, you know. Definitely. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much, Craig, for coming on and chatting with us over all this stuff. Um, If there's anything you wanted to toss out there for people of where they could find you, find your books, um, any animals that you might have available or something like that? Well, yeah. I'm, I'm you want them to leave you alone? <laughs> that works too. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you're if you're inter- interested in the books, you can get them through Eco Publishing, or you can contact me, um, you know, on Messenger or something. I mean, I can um, I can devalue it by signing it for sure. You know, then we try to know he's going to buy it, but, uh, you know, and I try to make it reasonable. I. I I, it, is it Caulfield or is it some great book? No, but I think what it'll do is get the juices flowing and challenge you to, to make your own stories and go out there. You get off your butt and, and go walk around a little bit and do it while you can. Mm-hmm. And Keith knows that now and I know that. Yeah. And I'm going to get off the subject for one second here because I am who I am. I'm still a registered nurse and oncology nurse. I'm retired and I don't need to work, but um, uh, a little little note without giving too much away, uh, Keith and I both went through uh, prostate cancer, and people go, ah, it's just prostate cancer. Well, prostate cancer kills a lot of men, a lot of young men. So when you go get that uncomfortable little digital thing, you know, where you want to turn around and make sure it's somebody's finger, and, you know, <laughs> it's not comfortable for any guy, um, also demand to have a PSA, because a lot of physicians are... Now saying, well, I'm going to need that for like 10 years. Uh, the truth be known is have that PSA to uh, the prostatic specific antigen because those yeah. numbers will tell the story. And you always want to try to be a stage one, stage two, not a stage four with metastatic disease and go get the prostate check because it's a simple thing and nobody should have to die of that. So right. that's yeah. inappropriate, not here, but I am who I am. And I believe in, you know, um, trying to uh people, there's so many cancers people shouldn't die of so right exactly. let's let's just die of a big juicy russell's viper bite or something there you go <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, let's 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 stay away from the malignancy thing okay. yeah. if you got if you got to go why not pick your favorite venomous snake and just go yeah, that way well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that might be a little messy that yeah problem. probably let's, yeah now that you think about let's it let's go with an inland <laughs> tape hand or something Some, something know. quick yeah something quick yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, this has been fantastic. Um, 
Welcome back anytime. And, uh, of course, I'll be waiting for an email of dirt I can use for Keith McPeak for later. <laughs> um, Buddy is coming in volumes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, there, look, there's, there's so many people that owe me so much, and uh, my next book is Keith McPeak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll find it in your him. pornography section. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big old picture of Keith right on the cover. I love it. Yeah. It's perfect. We won't, we won't elaborate on that. So. No, no, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this has been fantastic so uh keith rob if you guys had you need anything to throw out there and and talk before i uh end the show and eric has once again missed a really good one that i've done as her history again yeah yeah no, i i just want to thank craig for coming on and sharing his story sharing part of his life with us and uh i wanted to tell craig to make sure he gives linda a big hug for me and i'll do uh, that and i can't wait to see you guys soon Boy, this sounds like some kind of old 70s movie, right? I'm trying to hug Linda. I'm trying to hug your wife. Let me put it this way, Keith. If, if something happens, I'm not getting in bed with you, pal. <laughs> you tell your lovely wife, I'm pretty old, but she's, she's a sweetheart. <laughs> and, uh, so we'll leave all that alone and, uh, but you know uh, in all seriousness thanks Keith uh, you're a good one and uh, I, I love the fact you're a quality human being in so many ways the snake thing's just one aspect and part of you you're a good family man and um, we need more of that and we need more of that amongst all of us uh, family's always more important than the planet snake tune yeah. And uh, we can be we can include that family in our love and our passion. So just yeah. try try to do that. Reach out, be generous, give something to kids. Take your time. It's it's uh, we're, we're a little bit of a selfish industry right now. And we, we need more people reaching out, doing good things. 100 percent. Definitely. Yep. Rob, you got anything else or. Nope, I just read He's asleep. everything. He's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's out there, Man, I got right? two hours yeah, ahead. Yeah, you're getting a little soft on me. No, it was great. <laughs> Yeah. Well, all right. That that is where I will end it for everybody here at the channel. You can go and uh, search all the Morelia Python Radio uh, shows on the channel. Boa, boas, boas. Uh, all. I, I'm not even going to get into it. All of them. You know what they are if you're here. Um, Join the Patreon and uh, check out the Teespring store, and we'll check. We'll catch everybody back here next week for some more Morelia Python Radio. Good night. Thanks.